Hey everyone, Matt Straub welcoming you to the 2022 NBC Sports Edge Fantasy Baseball Live Draft. We are excited to have you with us the next couple of hours as we have got a great group of experts here to draft a 12-team fantasy league. And by the way, if your drafts are approaching, you can get an edge on draft day with our premium online draft guide that is packed with rankings, projections, tiers, ADP reports, mock drafts, expert columns, and much more. Don't forget to use promo code BASEBALL20 to get 20% off any subscription. Go to NBCSportsEdge.com slash MLB Draft Guide to check it out. And we've got 12 experts here. We'll be drafting 20 rounds in total, and this is a traditional 5x5 five five league with batting average. So quickly, let's run through the draft order and introduce our experts who will be here today. First up, we have DJ Short from NBC Sports Edge, who some are saying has rigged to give himself the first pick, followed by a couple veterans of these draft shows, Scott Pianowski from Yahoo and Jen Piacenti from SI will be picking third. Picking four, five, and six in this draft will be Ryan Boyer, Chris Towers from CBS, and Vaughn Dalzell from NBC Sports Edge Betting. Colin Henderson and Chris Crawford pick seventh and eighth, followed by Jordan Schusterman from Cespedes Family Barbecue, drafting ninth. And picking 10 through 12, it's Justin Mason from Fantasy Benefits and Fangraphs, Shelly Verstray from The Pitcher List, and our very own Drew Silva from NBC Sports Edge's 12th. I will be joined by three analysts at a time for five rounds each. As we go through this live draft, so let's welcome in our first group. It is the aforementioned DJ Short, Scott Pianowski, and Jen Piacenti with Mr. Short. Joining me first, there's Scott, Jen. Hi, guys. DJ, you're on the clock here, about a minute to go. Uh, you've rigged this to give yourself the first pick. Where are we going with I it? Did. Uh, so this decision might have been harder couple of weeks ago (laughs) before uh, Fernando Tatis Jr. got hurt. But uh, I know there's been some momentum for Juan Soto. Uh, In my mind, he's the best hitter in baseball. But, you know, this is a fantasy game. And I think with my first pick, usually with the first round pick, I I want the safe floor. I want to touch all categories. So Trey Turner, I think, is the best option. Uh, Won his first career batting title last season. Uh, Didn't steal as many bases as... He no, you would normally expect, but his speed is still the best in the game. And now he gets a full season in that Dodgers lineup, which just got deeper with the addition of Freddie Freeman. So and he's going to rake up those runs scored, safe playing batting average, the speed's there, the power's there as well. So you, you really can't go wrong with, with Trey Turner. So spoiler alert, once, once it's my turn in a few seconds here, it, it's going to be Trey Turner. And, here and I mean... That's Scott. That's who we're seeing really go off the board in a lot of drafts, right? I mean, no, no real surprise, no big reach here from DJ as you're now on the clock second. Yeah, I think Turner's become the auto pick. He's become he's going to be the consensus number one pick in every league now, as with the Tatis injury. And I have, you know, and, and man, do you want to get invested in that Dodgers lineup? I the last time I checked on Fanographs, everybody in their lineup was projected to hit 20 home runs. All, all sorts of average OBP in that lineup and a bunch of guys who can steal bases. You just need to have a piece of it if you can get some of it. I have inflection points. Juan Soto, as I think DJ said, is the best hitter in baseball, but the Washington Nationals lineup is not anywhere close to the best lineup in baseball. And we know that stolen bases are kind of a pain in the neck right. now. And uh, I just looked at your magazine, your, you know, that everybody should buy for their draft. And Bo Bichette was actually the cover boy. So maybe I, I'm feeling a little bit of gravitational pull but I want a better lineup. I want to get a steals base. I want a five category player, which as great as Juan Soto is, he is not a five category player. So uh, this may be controversial. Bo Bichette may slide to the four, five, six spot in some leagues, but I'm going to take him right now at number two. Love it. Love it. Well, I'm going to be a little bit controversial too. Maybe not that controversial, um, but yeah, Juan Soto is the guy we've already both mentioned. We think he's a total stud. But I'm with you both. I kind of like to have those steals in my first round. I like to have that solid yeah. floor. And it is a very thin third base position this year. I'm going with Jose Ramirez. Wow. Yeah, I dig wow. it. I dig it. You know, of Ramirez, maybe not the, you know, he's probably not going to hit 300. And, and you know that right. at this point, but he's certainly not going to hurt you. Uh, his approach is really, really solid. It gives you the power, the speed. The Indians lineup, not great, but. Ramirez is being mentioned out there in trade rumors. Last week, the Blue Jays were mentioned as a possibility. Very busy team, obviously. But (laughs) there's a chance Ramirez could be on the move to a better destination, if not before the season, then at some point during the year. 
So I knew uh, DJ would be would lose the pool for the first player to not the first manager to not say Guardians instead of yes. uh, the former nickname uh, Cleveland. So yeah, uh, this draft has gone haywire uh, immediately. I, I'm going to put a, put a nickel in the jar. To know, yeah, the, Scott, the tango yeah. court is in full effect. I, Juan Soto goes fourth. Uh, Vladimir Guerrero goes, goes fifth. No, no problem with those picks. And, and we all said the three of us all said the same word or the or the same uh, synony- synonymous word with four, right? Every every one of these players has the upside where they could be the MVP of the league or something like that. But I also like to have floor with my early picks, which is why I won't consider like a Jacob Degrom or somebody in the first round. I'm not trying to put my hair on fire with this pick. I, I want somebody who I feel is – look, they're all great. They all have monstrous upsides, but I am always going to be floor-driven. This is – if fantasy football were the topic, I'd be the same way. I want somebody who I feel very confident is going to set me a foundation. And, and kind of along with those lines, the sixth pick is Mookie Betts. M- maybe Mookie Betts doesn't have quite the same upside as some of these other guys because he's mm-hmm. deep enough in his career. Does he want to run anymore? But whenever you make an investment in that Dodgers lineup, you're just surrounded by so much goodness. Uh, Mookie Betts, I can't see him having a bad season. Now, at the end of the year, if like Mookie Betts is like overall player 17, you're fine with that. You just need him to be a foundational block. He doesn't. None of these guys have to be the best player in fantasy to justify right. where we took them. So and, one thing about Mookie Betts, which is interesting, he's second base eligible in Yahoo this right. year, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, to have that flexibility, you know, maybe you do end up using him in the outfield, but to lock that in early, to have that flexibility and see how the rest of your draft plays out. I think that's really nice with bets. A nice bonus. Yeah. yeah we, Yahoo does have very liberal uh, eligibility <laughs> requirements. So well, I think we're going to find, and this, <laughs> this plays into Jen's pick is actually the corners. The first base and third base area I find is a lot thinner than second base and yeah. shortstop. You're not going to have trouble filling the middle, I don't think, although we'll certainly take the extra qualification with bets. But you're going to be surprised how quickly you're going to feel pinched at first base and third base if you don't address those positions fairly expediently. Yeah, and I checked, and DJ Short has just been given third base eligibility on Yahoo. So <laughs> an update for you there. And all three of you guys have to feel great getting – steals right all of you 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 mentioned floor scott the key operative word for the three of you though is speed you all address that with your first picks you can you can almost breathe a a little bit of a sigh of relief there as after mookie bets we saw bryce harper and garrett cole go jen how much of a relief is that to you to to just feel like you've already got a little you're, you're standing on firm footing when it comes to steals this early yeah it's really almost always my goal in the first round because that is the elusive category, right? You don't want to be stuck chasing steals late where like in years past, you were like having to take a chance on a Michael Bourne or a Malik Smith because you're so far in the hole. So if you can get, if you can set the table nicely for all five categories, that is always my goal when I, when I can. And as Scott mentioned, you don't have to pick the best player in the first round. You have to pick a player that you can count on. That's the way to think of it. Not think about, you know, oh, I'm going to pick a, actually pick the guy that's going to end up number one. You want to pick a guy that's going to set up your team for success. Now, as you mentioned, Jose Ramirez doesn't bat for a lot of average, but that doesn't mean that later I can't go way deep in the draft and uh, augment with, say, like a Michael Brantley to help me out with average. Those are a lot easier to find. Steals, really tricky unless you want to bet on a Nicky Lopez late. So I feel a lot better about it. It's similar to the save situation, but you're not going to take a saves guy in the first round. Yeah. And what's interesting about this draft, we're doing 20 rounds. So, you know, it's a shallow type of league. So when you get later on in your draft, sometimes you're taking that one trick pony who steals bases, but they're going to hurt you in other areas. So to get that out of the way early, kind of get these five category type of players, this is the time to get them. Yeah, Jen said the the magic word, which is uh, my goal was always in the last few seasons was not to be the Malik Smith manager. Now, now Smith isn't <laughs> really draftable anymore, but you know maybe that means that you don't want to draft Nicky Lopez or Miles Straw uh, because yes. your your roster has been set up with that flexibility and with that you know filling five categories early. Now there aren't a lot of five category players. It'd be nice to say, yeah, just keep drafting five category players and stock up your mm-hmm. offense. I mean, they're, they're going to go off the board really quickly. We might not even mm-hmm. have guys like that who fit that suit later in the, in the second round, but yeah, you don't want to be drafting that, that, uh, that speed only guy. That's generally one of my concepts when I go into a draft. DJ, we have right, a I little think- bit of a, we have a controversy breaking out. A controversy is the wrong word, but Fernando yeah. Tatis Jr. went ninth. Is that what you're about to address DJ? <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm going to roll this back. There's talk uh, of a rollback. There is talk of a rollback. 
So we are rolling back. We've rolled it back. I was I was about to ask you guys about that. Uh, I didn't know if Jordan Schusterman was just you know making a bold statement there. Obviously, Tatis <laughs> going on undergoing wrist surgery. So yeah. Garrett Cole went eighth. That's the guy who we, the one starting pitcher, right? We pretty much expect to see go in the first round, right, DJ? Yeah, absolutely. I think he's the most uh, bankable there, and you know something to think about. Also, the DH is universal now. So that levels the playing field for everyone where in the past, maybe you would want that national league starting pitcher. Uh, but now you, you're not going to shy away from necessarily taking an AL pitcher. So it, everyone's kind of more on even footing. All right. And then Raphael Devers is actually the pick to Jordan Schusterman at nine, followed by Corbin Burns. Uh, Scott, what are your thoughts on Burns as a first rounder this year? Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Cespedes Barbecue for showing the functionality of the Yahoo draft room. That there's yeah. a mistake made. The, the commissioner true. can roll things back. You have the ability to pause a draft. So, um, you know, these things happen sometimes and, and we can yeah. we can flex with those. You, you know, Burns is great. I, I still think he's more of a second round pick for me. He, he's only had the one monster season. I'm, now, granted, I want to have a front man on my staff. I want to have somebody on my staff who I can see possibly as a Cy Young candidate. So if you choose to attack that in the late half of the first round, I'm fine with it. I'd probably rather take my first pitcher in the second or third round, but I'm, you know, Burns is, he's top three, I think in everybody's board. I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's less of a priority. Like I think in recent years we've seen, you know, uh, managers take like the pocket aces to like start the draft. I, I think there's a nice middle class of starting pitchers where if you get a pitcher in the second or third round, you can wait a little bit and start to supplement your staff. I don't think you have to rush to get starting pitchers this year. The player who went in the first round who I want on as many teams as possible, and I seem to keep missing him, is Kyle Tucker, who is, I think he has the upside to maybe steal 20 bases. Houston's another lineup that's just fortified with all sorts of great players. The one thing about Tucker that's a little bit frustrating is he may open the year batting uh, number six in that lineup because they want to space yeah. out the lefties. I don't think he'll end the year hitting sixth. I think he easily end the year hitting second. Of course, Alvarez is a monster in the cleanup spot. I, I know, Jen, I know you're close to the Houston situation. Uh, Are yeah. you with me that, uh, that Tucker is a bona fide first rounder? Because I think he is. I think he probably is. My only concern is actually the speed because if you look, his speed is not actually very elite and they keep putting him in that six hole now. Since they traded Carlos Correa, I have more optimism for Kyle Tucker being able to move up in the lineup, especially if Alex Bregman doesn't return to form, um, then he definitely has a chance to move up. But the, the real problem is that, you know, Altuve Brantley, that's one, two, set three spot. Right now it's Bregman. Uh, then you probably have, Jordan, you know, you still have the reigning AL batting champ in the lineup. Those bottom three spots, Kyle Tucker has to move up. It's just a matter of how much Dusty will let him run. So, yeah, 15 bags, I think you probably uh, can expect. But I don't know if we'll see, see the ceiling we should if they keep him too low in the yeah. batting order. And the ceiling might be 15 steals. So if you're looking for the floor, like that's a little potentially dangerous uh, for a first rounder. It's, I guess the way I look at it is, on one hand, I see the his percentage of stolen bases has been very high, and I always wonder if players, like like last year, Mod Rosario was 13 for 13. I think, well, if he was 13 for 13, why not go 20 for 22? I mean, you know, he, they didn't catch him at all last year. But Houston is a very analytically friendly team, and, and we've seen, okay. as baseball has become more about optimization, the stolen base has been phased out. What's the point of stealing for, you know second base when you're just trying to hit a three-run home run anyway? So um, maybe the idea is that Houston as a team might steal like 100 bases where five years ago, this might have been 160, 170 steal team. Right, right. And something to think about for next year, the bases are going to be bigger. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. going to increase the stolen bases. Not going to get that this year, but it's something to think about for, for future seasons. I think the stolen bases are going to start to increase again. You know, you so talked about DJ, you talked about earlier about Garrett Cole, American League East. It's not as big of a deal because the universal DH – is there a division that you think is easiest for a pitcher to attack? I, I, I look sometimes with, if you get Houston pitchers, they're going to get Oakland, you know, six times a year. Do you, have you kind of shaken down where, where the, the soft landing spots are for divisions uh, divisionally wise? It's got to still be the AL central. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the twins, are, it looks like they're competing. So it's, it's hard to say, but I still think the AL central, I mean, the tigers are improving. Uh, the Royals lineup isn't terrible, but not great. Um, that's probably where I would go, but I don't know if there really is 
an easy landing spot, maybe NL Central too, because the Reds are trading some pieces. Uh, the Pirates aren't competing this year, so that's possible as well. The Central Central divisions would probably be uh, the best targets at this point. At some point, it's going to become impossible to call out every pick that happens in this draft. But we just saw, Jen, in the second round, you took Freddie Freeman and then Matt Olson, interestingly enough, went one pick after him to you, Scott. Um, that now puts you on the board, DJ, with the last pick of round two. So what First are we First baseman here? run, DJ. First baseman run. <laughs> Yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't feel great about my first base options here. So I am going to take a player who is hurt at the moment, but I don't think he's going to be hurt for very long. Uh, Starling Marte with the Mets. I know he has some oblique soreness right now, but we're still far enough out that I think he'll be OK. Um, and he's still doing activities. He's just not swinging a bat yet. I think there's enough time that he'll be OK. Again, getting the batting average, getting the speed. I'm going to dominate steals here <laughs> uh, with, with Turner and Marte. No question about that. I'm going to have to start to supplement with power. But now that I've taken care of the speed, I think that'll be an easier task for me. Um, and it's time for me to take a starting pitcher, too. I definitely would have taken Zach Wheeler if this was like two weeks ago, because uh, prior to the injury, he's not really injured, but he's a bit delayed uh, with some shoulder soreness. Um, I would have taken him here. He was a number five, top five starting pitcher for me. But now I'm going Julio Urias. Wins matter in fantasy baseball. And Urias is in a great situation. Won 20 games last year. Part of that great Dodgers lineup backing him. Uh, bullpen's good, solid. I think he has a great shot for 20 wins again. The Dodgers finally let him run last year. They let him pitch deep into games. You know, for many years, Urias was watched so closely in regard to his workload. But now I think he's going to throw high 190 innings, perhaps uh, win 20 games, post a solid ERA strikeout. So that's kind of what I'm looking for right now. Yeah, I think, you know, people we've gotten to the point where we're so smart about the volatility of wins that we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. And we forget the simple Occam's razor of you know, get a pitcher who's going to throw a lot of innings on a good team. I feel like I need a pitcher here, and I mean Bieber looks good, Giolito looks good, but I'm going to take Brandon Woodruff just for that dominant whip. Now maybe Milwaukee isn't as good as Chicago, who I, I think they're going to win. The White Sox are going to win 100 games, um, but I, I wanted to have for every three rounds, I want to have about one pitcher. That's kind of the ratio I'm looking for, and it may look weird that that Jen took Freeman and I took Olson back to back. I want to make it clear: I think Freeman's certainly the the preference because the lineup is so much deeper. And he has a longer resume. Freddie Freeman just doesn't have bad seasons. He spits at, at balls. He swings only at strikes. So I think there's actually a decent gap between those players. It just so happened that everybody I was targeting in the second round was gone. So I decided to take Matt Olson in a very deep Atlanta lineup. But it's not like I consider him equal to Freeman. I think Freeman's certainly the preference there. Matt yeah, Olson also gets a, a – sorry, DJ. He also gets a big park upgrade. I don't know what you were about to say. but that Yeah, I was going to say uh, Olson's plate discipline got so much better last year. So I don't think he's the batting average risk he once was. And like you said, the ballpark upgrades there, I think he can hit 40 bombs. And and Freeman's not necessarily someone who's going to hit 40 home runs. He'll hit you 35. Um, but, you know, he's as safe as it gets at first base. I do think there's a gap there, but I don't think it's as big as we might think. Well, Matt's got the Atlanta jerseys. He's got Trey Young. He's got uh, Jason Hayward. So I'm, I'm assuming if we did the show in, in a week's time, you know, Matt Olson's jersey would be up there or, it's I don't know, mail. Ian Anderson or it's something. You get to up, update the, the Braves jersey you got there. Kenley Jam, Jason Hayward? Back there. Okay. <laughs> You're saying the Jason Hayward jersey's not timely, Scott? I, uh, <laughs> uh, is is grounding up the second base a category in this league? Is this Ooh. after reach that functionality? I'm not sure if we have. Uh, f fair, fair. Uh, Jen, you took Tim Anderson third. Uh, do you? It, are you finding yourself waiting on starting pitchers, or is that just how this board fell to you? It's just how this board fell to me. So uh, we did ta my tout draft just a couple weeks ago, and it was while the lockout was still happening. So it was March 1st. And in these two spots, I started with Jose Ramirez there. I had the third pick. And then I went to Wheeler, and then I went to DeGrom. Uh, and I loved that start on March 1st. Now, um, I still would take DeGrom, um, but Wheeler, I'm a little bit more nervous about. I still debated doing it because they say that he's still going to pitch, that the last start he missed was due to the flu, but I don't know where there's smoke. Sometimes there's fire. So I decided to go ahead and uh, continue with the theme of getting a guy that hits all 
five categories, and that is 100% Tim Anderson. So just trying to set up a really stable floor. There is a very sneaky advantage to getting Tim Anderson. He's hit over 300 three straight years, and he doesn't walk a lot. And I realize we're in an era where he's like, oh, you, you get to walk, and you don't want to strike out and everything. Because Tim Anderson bats over 300 without the walks, you get more batting, you get more plate appearances, you get more times at bat. So he actually gives you more bang for his buck as an average guy. And he's the trigger man in an absolutely loaded Chicago White Sox lineup. You're going to want to have them on your every night viewing list. So I, I think Tim Anderson, the third round is a fan. And I actually would have considered him, but I didn't already have Bichette. Shortstop's kind of a deep position. We talked about mm -hmm. maybe third base and first base aren't deep. I think shortstop is deep this year, but just remember Tim Anderson. So what? He doesn't walk. I don't care. He's going to hit 300 and give me more bang for my buck because I'm going to get more at bats out of him. So two recent signings just went off the board. Uh, Trevor Story to Colin uh, just recently signed with the Red Sox, six years, 140 million. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick Castellanos uh, goes off the board, number 33. Wow. Um, and Castellanos just got five years, 100 million from the Phillies. In that ballpark, I mean, Cincinnati is a great place to, to play as well uh, for power. But uh, that Phillies lineup is going to be a powerhouse. But I don't know if they're going to be able to actually catch the ball. That could That's, be you know, it's funny you said that. That's where I want to start with this. Nick, Nick Castellanos is a fantastic hitter. And, and I have, I think he's more of maybe a fourth-round player in a 12-team league. But, I mean, I'm not going to quibble okay. if somebody wants him in the 12th round. I saw this defense, and I and I love Aaron Nola. I love Zach Wheeler. You know, there's other pitchers on this team I would generally be interested in. I moved all those guys down because this is going to be the worst defense, I think, in baseball. I'm afraid that every time the ball's hit and somebody needs to make a play, I'm not sure they're going to make it unless they somehow rejigger their, their defense in the next couple of weeks. There are some free agents available, nobody really all that attractive anymore. But I think it's a legitimate problem. It's moved me off Aaron Nola, who I would have told you a month ago, was probably one of my targets. Now he's a no touch for me. Yeah, Can I think I Aaron Nola is. Just go ahead. I was going to ask if the opposite was true for you, Scott. Like when you saw that Matt Chapman signed in Toronto, did it help bump up some of the Toronto pitchers for you? Because for instance, I can't do Yusei Kikuchi. Everybody, a lot of people love him. I know. But then when they signed Matt Chapman, I was like, I don't know, maybe as a late round flyer maybe it, it should help they needed someone at the hot corner for their pitching i know kikuchi wasn't there last year but did it adjust how you felt about the toronto pitchers at all it would probably have to i'll have to get into the weeds a little bit more about who has a ground ball bias because that's where you know chapman can't help you when the ball's hit in the air but i mean he's such a great defender the yankees were even thinking about maybe signing him as a shortstop and it, it didn't go that way or making a trade for him as a shortstop but uh, that's a valid point um maybe it's just just you get caught up in these doom day scenarios right I, I mean for, for six weeks i was worried about the season starting on time and stuff like that but yeah. uh, it's about it's a valid point the, the thing with defense is normally with defense i just think okay play enough good defense that you're you're going to be in the lineup and it's not they're not going to mess around with you but we're at a point now where we know enough about defense i know defensive metrics are still in their infancy and they're not perfect but i, I think you have to play it both ways where if and it's on the extremes, right? So much in fantasy is like, I don't really care who's like the ninth best defense or the 14th best defense. We have to be familiar with what teams catch the ball and record outs really well and what teams are horrible about it. This might mean like two teams or three teams. The Cardinals, for example. Steven Matz yeah. is one of my late first uh, late round picks because they have five gold glovers. They, they mm -hmm. convert the ball into outs so easily. I care about that. I think the Phillies are on the extreme. So at the end of the day, there's maybe two or three teams on either side of the extremes that I'll consider it. And there's probably like about 25 teams where I won't even consider it at all. Yeah, I think what's interesting about Aaron Nola, if you look at his ERA last year, it was in the fours. All the expected metrics basically agreed. I think it was like 3.6, um, what his ERA should have been. And maybe you go in a draft season this year thinking, oh, he's going to have a you know sub four, maybe low three ERA based off of what he deserved last year. But at this point, you're kind of like, no, I, I can't be yeah. certain about that. And to me, Nola was a fringy top 10 starter. Maybe now I push him back to 15. And that looks like what the room is doing here. Well, and I just want to call out uh, Justin Mason, who's picking 10th, has, has gone reliever, reliever the last two rounds. Liam Hendricks pick 34 and then Josh Hader pick 39. As we come back toward you guys in round four, the fourth out of five rounds we're going to be doing together. At what point do you start to feel that do you, do you feel those two relievers are going off the board or we're seeing the top two guys gone are you, you that much more inclined to wait jen 
Um, I'm probably gonna, I mean, not to blow anything, I'm gonna look for who's next up. Um, I don't like to wait too long on relief pitching, to be honest. I like to get one guy that I can count on and then I can pump later. Um, I don't like to wait too long. So I'm going to want to see uh, who's left. So, you know, I probably want to get a Jansen or even a Presley at least. Um, so, yeah, he, that's. I'm glad you brought that up because I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> so Rafael Iglesias is still there. Class A is still there. Um yeah, I'm, I'm just telling gets you. Murky. It gets murky really fast. I, I don't think there's been a year where I've seen closers go earlier uh, than mm -hmm. this year. And, and a lot of that was because of the early drafts prior to the lockout uh, lifting. There's so, somewhat more clarity with closer situations. But I think, man, past the top like 15, 16 options, it's anybody's guess. So you do want to lock in a little bit of certainty, I think. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have double tapped it the way Justin did. And, and shout out to Justin, who just won the, the Laura Michaels Award for, you know, yeah. for being just a great spirit that he is in the fantasy world and, and symbolizing everything that Laura symbolized. So Justin Mason's a great man. Mm -hmm. I think once you get a Hendricks or a Hater that kind of locks you up from the other one, I don't think you need to take both of them. But I like to have one front like I said one starting pitcher I kind of like to have a front man I like to have one reliever that I can count on my goal is always to shop in the second tier and maybe get a first tier return at reliever one year I had Kirby Yates in the right season I had Blake Trine in the right season mm -hmm. Jordan Romano has been one of my targets this year although he's getting a little bit pricier and a little bit pricier by the going day he's also a little bit down in his velocity right now we can decide if that's something to worry about or not but I'd like to have remember with save striation, more saves will be picked up in baseball these days that don't have fantasy relevance. So you don't need as many saves to compete. I think as long as you have in a 12 team league, one guy you can really hang your hat on and then you can mix and match. Maybe you get a team in a committee where you find 10 saves, you hopefully make a couple of good pickups. I don't think you need two studs in the bullpen. So I'm not going to go that route, but I'd like to have one that I can, again, can rely on. So, so Scott just took, Scott just took Randy or Rosarena. <laughs> Uh, Jen, you got your first starter in Zach Wheeler and DJ, you're now on the clock for two here. So, so this is the player who I mean, there's been so many moves over the past couple of weeks that can make your head spin. But I think probably the player who is rising the most on my board right now is Chris Bryant. And that's who I'm going with here. He's eligible at first base, wow. third base outfield. I'm looking at third base because third base is not great. Um, I think some of the Coors Field road stuff can be a bit overblown, but certainly getting those games in Coors Field, all the extra plate appearances, that huge playing surface Coors Field, I think he's just going to rack up counting stats. And he had a good year last year. So I'm going Bryant, uh, fill in third base there. And I think I'm going to take a closer here. Um, I would have loved it, though, by the way, DJ, after, if after talking about Chris Bryant for about 25 seconds, you just took someone totally different. That would have been amusing because I it, you almost had that tone for a second there. <laughs> for, but For a minute, I thought I actually picked someone different, but I didn't. You fooled me. Um, I'm going to go Rysel Iglesias here. I think he's one of the most underrated closers in baseball. He's, he's just so good. Uh, I don't know how good the Angels are going to be. Um, but again, I, I think at this point, uh, you know, I've got my start, my got my ace starting pitcher taken care of. I've got my third baseman. I've got speed. Uh, now I've got some saves locked in, so I feel good. Remember, they said that Inglacius is only going to pitch one inning at a time this year, which is what you want from your closer. You don't want you don't want him pitching multiple uh -huh. innings necessarily. You just want him. Oh, we're up by three runs in the ninth inning. Go go get three guys out. We'll all shake hands. I like what you said about the road stats with Colorado. When people are appraising Trevor Story this year, don't do the the lemming thing of, oh, well, he hits so poorly on the road. I'll just double that, and that's what he becomes now. There's a, a hangover factor when you play for the Rockies where your timing gets messed up with the breaking pitches, and then mm -hmm. you're not as effective on the road. And then you see we've seen it so many times. Matt Holiday left Colorado, was fine, was better on the road. DJ LeMahieu left Colorado, was better on the road. These players do not become the duplication of their road stats the moment they leave Colorado. So don't make that mistake when you're appraising Trevor's story. Totally. And, and going to Boston, like, you know, he's fallen a bit on draft boards, but Boston's a pretty good place to be. So sure. I think he went 31st in this draft. I think that's a pretty good value. Yeah, Boston's the opposite of Oakland. If you've ever been to a game in Oakland, the game is almost a rumor. You're I, I, The one time I, I went, we were right behind the bullpens. I was in the first row, and you, you still really didn't have a great view of what was going on because you're so far away. 
at Fenway, Wrigley's like this. You're right on top of the field. There's no foul mm-hmm. territory. It's very difficult to hit a pop-up that they catch in foul territory in Fenway because, again, the crowd is right on top. That's Fenway's misunderstood. It's not actually a great home run park. It's a great offensive park, and I would – I would love to get anybody in that lineup. I think if you're drafting later, Enrique Hernandez could be a great value as somebody who might bat lead off and maybe score a hundred runs. He's not a traditional lead off hitter, might qualify at a couple of spaces. Christian Vasquez is a catcher. I, anybody in that Boston lineup, pretty much I'm interested in at their current ADP. Yep. So Scott, after DJ took Iglesias, Scott took Javier Baez. And now Jen, you just got Sandy Alcantara. After getting Zach Wheeler, so you've shored up your pitching staff, your starting staff, and strikeouts in a big hurry. How are you feeling about having those two after going the first three rounds without taking a starter? I'm feeling good. I, I feel like just as confident but with these guys. Uh, it's kind of like I always compare it to how I would do in an auction league as well or a Sally Cap draft. Um, I don't usually like to have the forty dollar pitcher. I prefer to have a couple twenty fives instead of you know. Mm. A, for a 40 or a 50 like so that's kind of how I feel now that Zach Wheeler has kind of dropped in value a little bit but as I said I still have confidence that he's going to be good we mentioned the poor defense for Philly but he still pitched to a sub three ERA with the same defense Aaron Nola had so assuming that the shoulder thing is just a very slight setback maybe he's not going to give you over 200 innings but if he gives me 180 uh, I'm happy with that so I feel like that's decent value and of course Alcantara we saw him really come on strong at the end of last season. So I'm betting a little bit that he'll build on that, but he has a lot of potential. And as you said, shoring up the strikeouts, that's important to me. And I I was tempted to take a reliever, but at that point, you know, this is an example of when you have to decide what's going on in the room. There has been a close run. Mm -hmm. So maybe I should have taken a reliever, but I kind of stuck to my guns and thought, you know, it's just, it just feels too early. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that there's a Kinley Jansen or Ryan Presley left that others won't notice uh, what we noticed about the closer run. And hopefully I can get one on my way back. I could probably still get a decent one. That's my hope, but it was a gamble. So we'll see if it works out for me or not. It is about reading the room sometimes. So you can't always go strictly by the ADP and the rank. You have to go with what's going on in the room. But uh, I decided to go the other way. Let me piggyback on that too. Anybody out there who's watching and listening, if you feel like you are the shrewdest waiver wire player in your league, or maybe you're the most engaged player in your league, there's just levels, there's leagues of all different sophistications okay if you feel like i'm the guy making the best pickups or i'm the girl making the best pickups during the season you probably need saves less than anybody else because you're going to get them in season now if you're in a league where Mm -hmm. everybody's super into it and it's a knife fight for anybody who just got a save the previous (laughs) night then then maybe you have to address it more proactively on draft day again again, you have to read the room as jen was saying you have to season it to taste to what the competition levels and patterns are in your league and so it, it, think of the past season you know last year who was getting all the all the plum free agents if that was you 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 maybe could punt free saves on on draft day if you felt like it now if it's a little bit more competitive or maybe even if you're the person who you know you just had a new kid you just have a new puppy like i do you don't maybe have enough time to, to monitor this stuff then i understand you might want to draft uh some saves you know again you have this is very variable you have to play to the the style of player in your room Good call. Pianowski's uh, attention, his bandwidth has been cut by 20 to 30% by the arrival of the, pu- of the puppy. Scott's <laughs> storyline we're going to be yeah, watching. Teddy, Teddy's going to ruin life. my seat. He's gonna, he loves me like crazy. And, he, you know, all, all those kisses in the morning are great. But, um, you know, it's not going to help me on the waiver wire. It's not going to help me pick up saves. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, that's the end of our five rounds together. We're going to bring in our next three experts shortly. DJ, Scott, Jen, thank you guys. Good luck the rest of the draft. Thank guys. you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good thank talk you. to you. All right, a quick reminder before we get to our next group of drafters. Baseball isn't the only thing kicking into gear this time of year. March Madness is well underway, and MLB and and NBA and NHL playoffs are just around the corner. And Edge Plus Premium Subscription will now give you access to our tools across every sport that we offer. Dominate your MLB draft, take down an NBA GPP, and get an edge on your March Madness bets. And don't forget to use your promo code BASEBALL20 to get 20% off any subscription. We're now going to welcome in our second group of drafters. It's Ryan Boyer, Chris Towers, Von Dalzell. Chris, 
is going to join us in a second. Hi, Ryan. Chris, I, I can't help but notice. I'm trying to see if you're the only, you're one of only a couple teams without any blue on the roster, meaning you have not taken a pitcher yet. Is that a deliberate strategy or are you just uh, liking the hitters too much that you're seeing available? Realized I need to turn my microphone on. I'm a professional. <laughs> Uh, it's not necessarily a deliberate strategy. My my preference is probably to end up with kind of two aces. You know, generally speaking, if you look at historic ADP data, the way starting pitcher tends to work is the first two rounds are by far the best values in terms of their hit rate and their their chances of having a truly elite season. You know, finishing as a top twenty overall player, top ten overall player. Third and fourth rounds, you got about a historically about a 50% chance of getting a top 100 season out of a starting pitcher from rounds five to about 10. You really, you're well below a coin flips chance of getting a really good season out of a starting pitcher. And so what I try to do is if I can, I want someone from, you know, one of the first two or three tiers, you know, the first four round pitchers. And then I want to kind of avoid it. It's kind of like the RB dead zone in fantasy mm -hmm. football, which has become this big topic of conversation. I don't think it's become as much of a topic of conversation at starting pitcher in fantasy baseball, but the results are very similar. It's those five through 10 rounds where you really get hurt at starting pitcher chasing because you start chasing guys who've never done it, guys who have injury risk, but you can talk yourself into upside. And so I want to avoid that range and turns out I'm probably not going to end up doing it. So my preference would be to draft a little differently, but between Salvador Perez, Vladimir Guerrero, Ronald Acuna, Byron Buxton, and George Springer, I have five of my top 30 overall players through the first five rounds. So it, it really was just that I I can't ignore the the values that I was getting, even if, you know, it's not necessarily the the ideal strategy for what I wanted to do. Interesting that you bring up Salvador Perez and that you draft in the third round because I kind of think of that and that you brought up fantasy football because I kind of think of that as taking the first tight end off the board, right, yeah. almost in what you did there. And now, Vaughn, you just took Kevin Gosman. Uh, you had gone Mookie Betts, Jacob DeGrom, Xander Bogarts, Paul Goldschmidt, Nolan Arenado, then Gosman. How are you feeling about the squad through the first six rounds here? I like my team a lot. I had some very tough decisions. You know, Freddie Freeman was out there at one point. I really had I was really high on him. Um, I also passed on Shohei Otani, which is never easy to do uh, with mm -hmm. the season that he just had. But uh, I really like the team that I've had. I mean, I feel like Goldschmidt, Betts, Arenado, Bogarts, all these guys have very high floors. And that's what I'm looking for very early on in the first couple rounds. Guys that you know are going to come with a certain type of production. Um, I have great hitters. And hopefully if DeGrom stays healthy, I mean, him and a Gosman combination is, is thrilling. So uh, I'm looking at a, a couple other pitchers right now. But I like the hitters I have as well. Ryan, we just saw you make your sixth pick. It was Corey Seager, and that followed up Juan Soto, the aforementioned Shohei Otani, Manny Machado, Cedric Mullins, I believe the only 30-30 guy in MLB last year, Aaron Nola, and then, as I said, Seager. So what are your thoughts on this top six? Well, Matt, I'll answer your question, but first let me get to what Chris Crawford just did. He took Fernando Tatis Jr. Yeah, yeah. And I was actually going to use my next pick on him. So I'm, I'm going to be forced to uh, force feed Chris Crawford a uh, St. Louis style pizza now, which I know is his favorite. Uh, but Tatis at that point in the draft, I think is fine, especially a shallower yeah. league like this. The replacement level is um, easier to find. And people forget you're not getting a zero for that roster spot. Um, right. So you're, you're still going to get, what, three, hopefully maybe four, they say, Tatis is a quick healer, uh, oh. worth a pro elite production. Um, okay, so now that that's my Tatis spiel. Back to my team. <laughs> uh, Soto at number four, I, I, you could say maybe he quote unquote fell a little bit. If you can do that in the four spot, yeah. I'm obvious, obviously fine with uh, grabbing him there. It was either going to be him or Vlad when mm -hmm. it was uh, when it was my turn to pick there. I decided to go ahead and go with Soto. The Nats lineup isn't. Um, it was Did my, you mean to do that? It was my pick again, and I got. Hey, DJ, can we roll that back? <laughs> okay. I, I made Chris Crawford. I made Ryan talk, and he. I know. Uh, I just, and I lost track of where I was. That's the host's um, fault. That's the host's fault. I'll take that one. By the way, I was actually higher than Chris Sale than the consensus before this recent injury. 
So I, normally I would have been okay with that before, uh, All right. before what just happened with the, with the injury. We're going to um, hope DJ's actually listening and I'm going to type it in the chat right now. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Keep talking. Um, yeah. So yeah, back to Soto. Um, the lineup, not great with the nationals a little bit better now though, with uh, Nelson Cruz hopping aboard. Um, also probably a little bit better with, um, uh, shoot. I'm blanking on his name. The young used to be the used to be their top prospect. I was going to make a joke about him helping the lineup by not being in the lineup anymore. He just got injured. Third baseman Carter Keboom. Yes, Carter Keboom. Thank you, Towers. Uh, so yeah, not the lineup you really want to invest in heavily, but Juan Soto's uh, kind of transcends that. Um, Manny Machado, I felt like there's a little bit of a third base tier drop off there. Not the strongest strongest position, so happy to have him there. Uh, Cedric Mullins, the ballpark, the left field being moved back at, at Camden Yards, not ideal, but it shouldn't really affect him too greatly. I think he didn't hit a single home run to the opposite field. He's strictly a left-handed hitter now. Um, so I'm not really concerned about that. Uh, overall, feeling pretty good about my squad so far, other than the the Chris Sale pick that I just got autoed on. But you know, well, you know. along along those lines, Ryan, we are attempting to, as Chris Crawford put it in the chat, reverse the sale. But we are <laughs> so far as of now, we are pressing onward. And, oh, oh, it's happened! It's happened. Update there everyone, it's happened. We're back to Ryan Boyer, who is not going to talk right now while he picks. Uh, Chris Towers. What, what's on your mind for this upcoming pick without giving away any names strategically? What are we thinking here? Yeah. So, you know, I, we talked about how I hadn't taken any starting pitchers by my last pick. I was looking at Kevin Gosman with my last pick. He would have been my first pitcher taken if Vaughn hadn't taken him right before me. So thank you. Vaughn, for that. Um, so I ended up taking Max Fried as my start as my SP one. And obviously that's not an ideal SP one. He doesn't have the, the strikeout upside in particular that you're typically looking for from uh, your number one starting pitcher. But I do believe in Max Fried's ability to limit hard contact and, mm -hmm. um, you know, get enough strikeouts. He does pitch, you know, relatively deep into games when he's healthy. So hopefully, you know, he can avoid some of the, the minor injuries that have limited him recently. Now I'm trying to figure out if I want to go with another hitter or if I think I can wait around and have that hitter still be there so i'm going to take that risk and i do acknowledge it's a risk um okay and i'm going to go with actually the guy that i got autoed last time when we were waiting and that's charlie morton and this is someone if you listen to uh fantasy baseball today with the cbs crew frank stanfield scott white and i we collectively seem to be trying to drive charlie morton's price up just by ourselves in every draft that we do because We've referred to Charlie Morton as, you know, I, I think one of the potential cheat codes in 2022 drafts because what we've seen from him over the past, you know, three or four seasons really has just been borderline ace production pretty much every season. Last season, 185 and two-thirds innings, 14 wins, two, 216 Ks, 334 ERA, 104 whip. That's really, really good production, and, and that's basically what he's done over the last four, maybe five seasons at this point, with the exception of 2020, which was the weird COVID season, and he was awesome in the postseason and then carried it over into 2021. He is coming back from that fractured tibia, I believe, or mm -hmm. fibula, uh, suffered in the World Series game. Maybe that'll be a, a reason that he gets derailed, although generally speaking, I think you'd rather have someone coming back from bone injury than a you know a ligament injury, especially if it's not a, a you know forearm or, or upper arm. So... I think Charlie Morton's someone that if you wait at starting pitcher can help you make up a lot of ground. And so that's a, that's a very popular strategy, certainly among the CBS crew and, and especially for myself. It's kind of a, anytime Frank Scott and I are in a draft, it's kind of a mad dash to see which one of us is going to get Charlie Morton and, and feel good about our team. Yeah. Chris, I think we're about five years removed from Charlie Morton's first threat of retirement and he's yeah. been a, a great value in every year since then. Yeah, he's kind of got that like Nelson Cruz, David Ortiz thing where he's just mm -hmm. like been a money printer for fantasy basically the yeah. entire time that he's been fantasy relevant. And there always seems to be some skepticism around him. Like, I don't know if he can keep doing this or I don't know if you know he can stay healthy, but 
he's just been rock solid for for a long enough time now that I just I don't really worry about him anymore. Yeah, and I mean, just legendary toughness, too. He pitched after that leg broke. I think he pitched a full <laughs> inning uh, or finished the inning. I can't remember which one it was. I'm pretty sure he just duct taped that thing up and was good to go afterwards. So Charlie Morton is is just a beast, uh, even in his late 30s. Vaughn, you took Logan Webb as your seventh rounder, surprise guy. Uh, you're, any concerns for you about him You know, being able to repeat that? I mean, certainly you think about something like that, but there's a lot of young pitchers that are coming up right now that I like a lot. And you know me on the betting side of NBC. I do a lot of K props. Logan Webb, we talked about Charlie Morton being a money printer. Logan Webb was a money printer last season, as well as Kevin Gosman. But now Webb's going to have to step up and be the ace in that rotation for San Francisco. You know, there might be hinders to him getting him this early in the draft when you get another guy. I mean, I was looking at, you know, I probably won't get any of these guys, but uh, Dylan Cease or Alec Manoa, like these type of guys I think have been stepping up, strikeout guys. Um, mm-hmm. And that's mainly what I'm looking for, guys with strikeouts and lower ERAs. And, I mean, Logan Webb's someone I feel comfortable with, even though he's on the younger side of uh, starting pitchers. And Manoa went uh, with the second-to-last yeah. pick of the seventh round. Will Smith went after uh, him. We're now on to pick 85, which is Drew Silva. He just took Luis Castillo. So – we're coming back around. Um, I'm just trying to look at these recent picks. Anthony Rendon is an interesting case, Ryan Boyer. I mean, after that brutal season, what are your expectations for him? Yeah, I'm not crazy about investing in a, someone coming back from hip surgery, but yeah. he, uh, I believe his recent quote is, this is the best he's felt in years. Um, so hopefully we can take him at his word there. I think it, if that's actually the case, pretty good, pretty good value here. You know, we've mentioned many times before that third base is not the deepest position. Um, pretty good Angels lineup that he's a part of. Uh, I think at that point in the draft, um, Anthony Rendon is worth is certainly worth a shot. We saw. Well, you know, I will say, third base is getting more uh, or or, or less shallow. Him. It's seen because. You know, we're hoping Bobby Witt's going to play third base if he gets called up to start the season. Chris Bryant all of a sudden goes from someone who's been the 100 range to, I mean, he went, what, 51 in this draft. I have him 60th overall. So, you know, Anthony Rendon feeling a little better. All of a sudden, I'm kind of looking at third base, and it's like, maybe it won't be so bad. And we're we're talking about a one-year thing. You know, I, I looked back at I'm, – I'm, I'm working on an ADP review series for each position, and so I looked back at – uh, something that we wrote on CBS Sports before the 2020 season. And uh, it was something that Scott White wrote about how he had never seen a position that was as deep as third base heading into 2020 in 12 years as a <laughs> fantasy analyst. And if you look back on it, yeah, that was a that was a, a crazy year. We had Bregman coming off a massive season. Moncada had that breakout. And then it seemed like everything went wrong at the position in 2021. But you know, you don't want to you don't want to be caught fighting last year's battles. And I think there's a risk of that with third base that it might just not be as terrible as we think. And I think Rendon bouncing back would be a big part of that. So I'm hopeful. Vaughn Vaughn's face just just told the whole story there. Let's just get caught up here. Jazz Chisholm, a run on second baseman, Jazz Chisholm, Jorge Polanco, Brandon Lau, Jordan Romano, and then Giancarlo Stanton just went. Is that what you're reacting to, Vaughn, as you're now on the clock? Yeah, that's my guy. Um, one guy I just definitely tries to hit home runs out of the ballpark every single time. And I don't have an outfielder yet, so that was kind of something I really wanted to get right now. And uh, he was number one on my list. I don't trust taking any other outfielders right now, so – I'm in a bit of a pickle with 25 seconds ago. It's a shot clock. I'd be a shot clock right now. <laughs> Mookie Betts. You just move Mookie Betts from second base to outfield and you're good to go. You're, I you're think that's what I actually might do, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to take, you know, I, there's two pitchers right now, Shane McCallaghan and Chris Bassett. I'm kind of interested in Chris Bassett going to the Mets now. Um, I think that's going to be really tempting, but I talked about Dylan Cease earlier and he's a 200 strikeout type of guy. So I'm going to take a shot on him and build my starting pitching or just my pitchers in ro- uh, rotation stronger anyway. So I got uh, DeGrom, Gosman, Webb, and Cease right now, and I feel like that's got to be a top three pitching staff so far. 
Chris, you're now on the clock. 45 seconds left to go for you. Can we trust you to talk and pick at the same time, or are you going to Ryan Boyer this thing? And no, I, I got my talk. pick set up okay. because this okay. was uh, the guy that I was thinking about taking, and I was hoping I could get him back last round. And frankly, I'm going to take Cattell Marte. He's going to slot in at second base for me. And I mentioned I had, what, five of my first 30 overall players uh, with my first five picks. Cattell Marte is a third-round pick for me. I'm so high on him. I think he is in it an elite bat if you look at the the quality of contact first of all he makes a ton of contact his quality of contact is borderline elite and it has been you know really for most of his season even prior to the 2019 breakout but 2019 was when he changed his swing started driving the ball in the air more it's not an ideal park to hit in chase park um you know holds back power production especially so it probably makes it hard for him to be a 30 homer guy but like he could easily win a batting title and hit 25 to 30 homers with a decent amount of runs in RBI. And I'm also, you know, I'd love to see him get traded as well. But I think Cattell Marte is um, one of the best pure hitters in baseball. And I think he's one of the best values this season. Ryan, you followed that up with a guy by the name of Justin Verlander. Talk us through the thinking there in round eight. Yeah, I went down a little bit as far as at least the, the Yahoo ADP goes among pitchers. But Verlander was the next guy on my personal mm -hmm. board. Um, velocity looked great. His first spring start. Um, I, you know, it's a, a one-year deal that I believe turns into a player. Is it a player option for next year? I, I don't know that the Astros are going to be super careful with his workload. Um, even though he did through exactly zero innings the year before, right. I'm not super concerned about that. Uh, looks like the arm strength is back and I realize he's 39, but, I don't have a problem putting trust in, in Justin Berlander. Um, I think he's going to be a workhorse even coming back from Tommy John. And I wasn't crazy about my first uh, pitcher selection of Aaron Nola. We've mentioned the Phillies defense is going to be maybe historically bad. Um, so I felt I needed to take a starting pitcher there, and Verlander was next on my board. I think probably has the, the most upside of anybody uh, that was there as well. Well, and we're right back to you, Ryan. Uh, after you took Verlander, we saw Jose Barrios, Jonathan India, Frankie Montes, Kyle Schwarber, Blake Trine, and Kenley Jansen, back-to-back -back relievers as we get back to you for your eighth, for your ninth-round pick and with Chris and Vaughn to follow. Yeah, I think I'm going to go with Shane McClanahan here, go ahead and double up on pitchers. Um kind of a weird season that McClanahan had. Like the stuff is just electric. You can see it's a, it's Definitely. not difficult to to see why he's one of the top – was one of the top prospects in the game. He got hit really hard. Um, I think mm -hmm. it was mostly probably the fastball command that was not great with him. But he, he's the kind of guy I think is just going to probably figure that out and – the stuff is going to play. He's going to get a ton of strikeouts. The Rays were actually kind of up this workload towards the end of the year. Um, I think he could be one of the guys that they kind of loosen the reins a little bit with this season. And I think the upside with uh, with Shane McClanahan is, is super high. So McClanahan, 141 strikeouts and 123 in a third innings. Shohei Otani, the pitcher, speaking of strikeouts, goes to you, Chris Towers. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, basically when we've seen him healthy, we've seen him be a, a very good pitcher. This is, you know, part part of the problem with my pitching staff so far is I've got Otani, I've got Max Fried, and I've got Charlie Morton, three guys who I think most people have pretty significant injury or inning concerns, and I think that's, that's not unfair. Um, and it's definitely a concern and something that I'll have to manage, and, you know, it might make it so that, at some point, I might want to take someone like Adam Wainwright, who, you know, seems a little more projectable in terms of innings, in terms of, you know, potentially getting to that 200 inning mark. But in terms of the effectiveness that these three guys are going to have um, on a per inning basis, I, I feel really good about Otani, Morton and Freed as a uh, baseline. I'll just have to, you know, figure out what it means as far as the volume stuff at some point with this pitching staff. Vaughn, you've set an in-draft record. I want to congratulate you. Four consecutive pitchers 
You're the only really? person to do that. Yep, yep. Four blue squares in a row for you. Chris Bassett, the guy you were talking about last round, you just got him. Uh, give us your thoughts. Well, I mean, I had to set a record somehow on here, and I guess that's a pretty <laughs> cool one to have. So I'll take that. Um, yeah, as I said, Chris Bassett going on to the Mets now. It's going to be him and DeGrom, you know, one and two. And they got some other good pitchers on that staff as well. That's That gives me confidence. They're going to earn a lot of wins and be a team worth looking at, you know, an over on the win total if you're a, a better right now. But honestly – there's a lot of hitters that I have in my queue, like 20 mm -hmm. to 25 to be specific. And I feel comfortable that a lot of them are still going to be there uh, after I took these pitchers, and a lot of them still are. Um, so with that being said, you know, I wanted to have as strong as a pitching rotation as possible because if DeGrom goes down, I'll need more than one guy to step up to fill his production. Um, so a guy like Dylan Cease and Chris Bassett, I feel like, are pretty good options in case DeGrom doesn't make it a full season. We saw Nelson Cruz go um, to Shelly Verstray's team. Uh, and Shohei Otani, the hitter earlier. Ryan, do you find yourself in Yahoo leagues like uh, shying away at all from the the guy who only has util eligibility? Does that bother you when you when you come to building a team? Not really. Um, I don't, especially when you are filling that utility spot with a guy like like Nelson Cruz. Yeah. Um, it it doesn't it doesn't really enter my thought process a whole lot, to be honest. Um, I'm just going to take the best fit for my roster, best player available. Um, and the good news with uh, with Yahoo's, the eligibility requirements are pretty liberal. So if you, it's not difficult to to find other guys that with multi-position eligibility that you can move around if you do have that guy that's stuck in the utility spot. So it, it's not something that really worries me too much. We saw Chris Crawford, maybe no surprise, uh, the prospects guy himself take Bobby Witt Jr. in the ninth round. We'll ask him about that in a few minutes. And Vaughn, we're actually coming up on your last pick you're going to make with us live here. So 10th rounder, you're on deck. Uh, do you already know what this pick is? Is there is there one guy you're hoping for? Well, as of right now, I'm filming this back in my hometown outside of Pittsburgh, PA, and there's a rule I live by, take former Pirates. They're so good. They're so much better once they leave Pittsburgh and we get rid of them. And there's two guys on this list right now that I actually want on my team. One of them I'm going to have to take. It's going to be Austin Meadows as long as Colin doesn't take him. Um, I love Austin Meadows. The guy doesn't strike out as much as, you know, the average player does, but he's a big home run hitter. He constantly makes big plays for the Rays. And I, to be honest with you, I have no idea why a team like the Pittsburgh Pirates let him walk while he was so young, but – you know, I can go down and run 10 names off this list right now of guys that are ex-Pirates and, and playing good. Um, and I want to say pretty surprised. Whoever took Brian Reynolds, I thought he was going to last a lot longer for me. Uh, that was the only Pittsburgh Pirate that I would that I would draft. Um, but, yeah, he went pretty early. So that's impressive that he's gone before guys like Austin Meadows and uh, Josh Bell and company. Yeah, Reynolds went in the sixth round. You do indeed get Meadows in the 10th. Chris Towers, you're on the clock in the 10th round. What's it going to be? This is a this is a tough spot because my my top players available are outfielders and this is something I always run into where you know I've got Ronald Acuna and Byron Buxton and George Springer so my outfield is set the three outfield spots uh, in in the Yahoo lineup is it's a little frustrating because it's the deepest <laughs> position even when you have to fill five right. spots so I'm just gonna fill that utility spot though how, okay. because. I want to put my flag down on Christian Yelich. I'm a big believer in the bounce back. And, you know, I think someone's joke, I saw someone joke on Twitter that like fantasy analysts are contractually obligated to rank Christian Yelich and Cody Bellinger back to back this season. And I actually have a little bit of a, a, a gap between them. Um, and mostly it's because Bellinger's swing was broken last season. He has to rebuild yeah. that. Um, yeah. And even like the postseason, he was okay, but he wasn't hitting for power. Yelich still hit the ball really well. He didn't hit it in the air like we've seen since he got to Milwaukee. He looked more like the Marlins version, but he got the strikeouts back under control relative to 2021's or 2020's really bad number. He was still walking. His sprint speed was actually still pretty good. The back injury was a concern, and it's obviously a concern moving forward because he's getting into his 30s, and, and that's – look, I got back issues as well, and I'm in my 30s now, so I understand. But he still hit the ball – at you know a borderline elite level in terms of quality of contact how often he hit it hard and so he really just has to fix the part where he's not hitting it on the ground as much he's done that before and we've seen him be the best player in fantasy I mean, he was on a 50 40 pace 
in 2019 before the injury. So I'm betting on Christian Yelich. I don't care if I have to put him in my utility spot. I, I think he's worth it. Well, they actually, Yelich and Bellinger are actually supposed to go back to back in the draft, not just be ranked next to each other, but we didn't have that happen. We had Ryan Boyer take Max Muncie. And Ryan, we got to run to the next group, but I want to just very quickly get your thoughts on Muncie before we go. Yeah, I'm pretty pleased with Muncie lasting that long, to be honest. I feel like his ADP is on the rise a little bit with him showing up to spring training healthy. He actually made a start, I believe, today at, at third base. So he's playing the field already. Um, I think at this point in the draft, he also gives you uh, eligibility at both first and second base. And I had both of those spots open. So he was kind of a no-brainer for me. All right, Ryan, Chris, Vaughn, thank you guys for coming through. Good luck the rest of the draft, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Matt. All right, see ya. Okay, we're 10 rounds into this thing and just want to remind you one of the best ways to prep for your draft is by, yes, drafting. Check out our mock draft simulator to do as many drafts, as many mocks, I should say, as you want for free. You can finish any draft in just minutes to help come up with a strategy that will give you the winning edge. Just go to NBCSportsEdge.com slash MLB mocks and start drafting. All right, we are getting into the second half of this draft now. We're into the 11th round. You can hear these next experts on the Circling the Bases podcast, Colin Henderson and Chris Crawford. They join us now along with Jordan Jordan Schusterman from Cespedes Family Barbecue. Jordan, What's up, uh, everyone? how's it going? How uh, how are things going so far? We we already had the uh, the excitement in the first round with the Tatis rollback. I feel like you've had an eventful draft already. Are things going to plan? Oh yeah, man. I mean, I clearly was ready. I, I didn't even <laughs> I didn't even know Tatis was hurt, and then you guys got to inform me that he was missing the first few months. So, uh, yeah, you know, hey, this was my uh, this is my first draft of the year. So give me a little slack, and I appreciate that. But I'm I'm thrilled to be on here my, with my good friend Chris Crawford and uh, everyone who's on this draft. Absolutely, and and as Scott Pianowski said, you you know you gave us a chance to test out the functionality of the Yahoo draft room very early. So well, that was great stuff. Colin, you actually just picked. You took Sonny Gray in the eleventh round. So uh, tell us uh, how you feel about that, and just your squad in general. Well, first and foremost, uh, one of the problems drafting right next to someone you do a podcast with is that yeah. they know each other so <laughs> unbelievably well. And Chris yeah. and I have been just, I, I can only assume that I've done it for you as well, Chris, but all I know is you've been sniping me like all drafts. So it's been crushing. But Sonny Gray uh, in general, look, the move from one of the best hitters parks to one of the best pitchers parks cannot be overstated for a guy who really the, the biggest knock on him has always been the long ball. If he can give, if he can limit home runs, that was always his thing. Now we are at the point. Oh, as we get a little pause. Okay. Um, oh boy. It, now we are in the point where he moves to a Minnesota team that suddenly a week ago to now looks completely different and looks like a team that wants to win, has the ability to win in a wide open NL, uh, American League Central. I think Sonny Gray has a great floor this year and I think can potentially punch up above his weight class in prior, at least in comparison to prior years. I just hope you get him again, Colin. We had a rollback yeah. there. We had a rollback. Yeah, I wasn't sure how far the rollback was. <laughs> We're, okay, so, yeah. so Pablo Lopez uh, goes to Chris Towers. Vaughn Dalzell is going to pick again, and I assume he's just going to take Sonny Gray from you now to mess all that uh, up. That's probably – he's probably listening right now. I make such a good <laughs> point. Kidding. I can't blame him. Yeah, if I know Vaughn, if I know Vaughn, that's what's coming. Okay, Ryan Mountcastle, you're going to get right, your guy. So Sonny Gray is safe. Okay, give us the Sonny Gray spiel again. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Chris Crawford, uh, well, you're on the clock. Are you ready I'm to talk clock. and draft? How's, I'm how's ready the squad to looking to you? Draft. I'm pretty happy. I will never talk to Jordan again after he took Wander Franco. Like, <laughs> literally lined up to select the guy, and he takes him <laughs> right in front of me. I, I take back all of the good things I've said about Jake and Jordan. I'm sorry, Jake. Jordan is vicariously living through you. Yeah. Uh, but I, I like this team a lot, I'm sure. I hope anyway, because I love controversy of people were talking about my uh, pick of Fernando Tatis Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm, I am a fan of this team. It, it, it's all it's easy to say that, but I do think I have a chance to compete against some really, really good fantasy players. And I am going to draft Tommy Edmond right now. Mm -hmm. Tommy Chris Edmond. Yes. Yeah. I, I need some stolen. I I feel good about the stolen base category, but there are very few guys that I think that are left that are like have the chance to get into that thirty range, and I like mm -hmm. the fact that Edmund can play in the outfield as well. 
Um, and I'm going to need probably somebody in the outfield because Fernando Tatis Jr. will be placed on the injured list about probably April 6th at about 11.59 p.m., I would guess, is when that roster move will happen. But, yeah, I like Edmund a lot at this point. Uh, so stolen bases, they don't exist to me. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I'll be honest, I draft very similarly. Yeah, yeah stolen bases are, a, are icing, but otherwise I'm grabbing the cake and, you know, hopefully there's some left there. So with my pick, I am, I'm just trying to have a damn good time and (laughs) I still don't have a first baseman. So Frank, the tank, come on down. We'll see if it's real. I don't, I don't know how much I truly believe in him. Sure. Um, He's someone that is obviously, we all know the story, but uh, his, his raw numbers, even compared to wisdom, um, were just unbelievable. I mean, he it, it obviously, you know, small sample galore, but he never really got his chance at his previous stops, and, and he did, and, and he took advantage. Those are one of the best best things in baseball is, is when stuff like that happens for, oh, for, sure. for, you know, players in their late 20s or early 30s, so you'd love to see that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in terms of my team, like I said, I don't I – don't, steals, what are those? I mean, <laughs> ma- major league yeah. teams have been uh, neglecting the stolen base for a long time, for several years now. So I'm just trying to act like all the smart – major league teams across uh, the game and just bring a bunch of big, big boy sluggers. I can't believe I took a Red Sox and a Yankee uh, to start off my draft. I don't really know what that was about, but Rafael Devers is one of my favorite players by far. And oh, yeah. I was just, just earlier today, just doing some general, you know, season prep stuff and just thinking about how big of a deal it is that Aaron judge could be a free agent. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like if he can stay on the field, he should be absolutely unbelievable. Um, and yeah, then, you know, Cassianos is pretty, pretty love the fit in the, in the Philly ballpark and B Lau is extremely underrated and, you know, had to get me a Mariner and Mitch Hanniger. And then of course, take, go. take, uh, Wander Franco from, from Chris, but also I'm sorry, as I'm about to pick again, why is Correa ranked so low? I know again, to your point, Minnesota ballpark is not great, but like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I feel like he was, I, again, yeah. I'm not a fantasy expert at all. So it just seemed like, wow, he's still on the board. Okay, cool. Let's make this happen. So you could tell me. I don't know. Is it yeah, you guys no, take no. That? I, Colin, I, I, th- I think I think the only issue with I think with Correa is the fact that he's not going to run. And again, you know, you're not you're Mr. Anti Stolen Base, so that does hurt him a little bit. <laughs> perfect, and I think there's perfect. I think that I think there's some volatility with his where his batting average is going to be. Like he's had a bit of a saber hagany run with terms of batting average. Like some some years where it's in that 290 range, some years where you're closer to like that 270 range. I might be talking out of my you know what a little bit because I don't have the numbers in front me but he has been a volatile offensive player so i do get that i love the fit though and i like that the park i I think carlos correa is going to be a shortstop one so i think it it, i think it was pretty good value all right for my next pick appreciate that mr expert chris crawford (laughs) yeah trusted you many (laughs) many times over the years and i hope he really made you feel good about that one (laughs) Um, all right with my next selection i'm going to take the man who we most recently saw give up a home run seven hundred thousand feet and that's luis garcia nice who is at the top of the board i do need some more pitching i might also be punting on on saves here um, but couldn't bring myself to take David Bednar as much as I love him. And yeah, I think Luis Garcia is awesome. He's super underrated. I honestly, him and Christian Javier, I, I love both of them. Um, but yeah, I think he should still win a lot of games and, and, uh, he's just awesome. And I mean, his hair is unbelievable. So it's really good hair. Uh, so I'm on the, I'm on the clock here and I need a first baseman and there's like six guys who I have all ranked in the same range of Guriel, Mancini, Votto, uh, Rizzo and Lordis Goriel also eligible at first base, which is, it is what it is. I, oh boy, I think I'm going to go with the guy that I just like the most here. And you know what? Sometimes that's okay. Trey Mancini was one of my favorite stories of last year because of course he was like, and I think he's going to be a little hurt by the ballpark change in Baltimore, but also mm-hmm. I think he has enough raw power that it doesn't really matter. I still think he's going to be right around that 25 to 30 homer rate. You need dingers in fantasy baseball. And I could also see Trey, Trey Mancini also maybe changing clubs by the end of the year as well. So that's uh, something to keep in mind as well. But if, if I was, if <laughs> Yuli Gurriel is probably a better fantasy play at this point, but I'll go with the power upside of Mancini over Gurriel. <sighs> 
I, I just I like that both of you guys are staying true to your principles and just drafting squads you like. You know what I, I mean? Like, yeah, man, that matters. <laughs> Colin, all right, well, I, oh, you 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 picked Trent Grisham. Yeah, all three oh. of us are right next to each other, so we're all gonna have little <laughs> moments of quiet as all three of us focus for a hot second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like where my take team's us, at. I like my team pick. overall. Yeah, sure. I like where my team's at overall. I think my offense is looking great. I mean, again, I think uh, Vink Vaughn on the other side of this was talking about only three outfielders means that you can kind of start looking at things a little differently rather than mm-hmm. have to fill out five outfielders or a corner infield or a middle infield. So a little different there. I might be a little too heavy on offense. I look, my offense should be great. I think it's got five category across the board. Uh, need to do a little bit more work on my pitching staff. I'll be honest with you. I was looking at a bunch of pitchers in the last round, but Trent Grisham sitting there. If that Padres team bounce back the way that I expect, I think he could be towards the top 10 in the national league in runs. I think he could be towards the top 10 in the national league in stolen bases. If they really move them, especially with Tatis out early in the year. Um, I, I think he's got just a ton of potential and I just could not swing past that. But um, I know that I'm going to have to finish out the rest of my draft with um, some pitching, but I think I still think there's some good pitching that's out there right now. Granted, sure. as I say that, like two of them just got snapped up, but I yeah. think there's a lot of good pitching out there still that by the time it comes back to me in two picks, uh, a couple of them will still be available for me to grab. So I think I'm set up pretty well. And yeah. the four, the four starters who went after you, after after your pick, Michael Kopech, Tyler Molly, Framber Valdez, and Shane Baz are the four. And we're coming back down toward you again, Colin. Uh, Chris Crawford, you got you mentioned, one of you guys mentioned that you've just been sniping each other back and forth. What's the one pick you're most angry about that uh, Colin took from you so far? Well, I'll be honest with you, the Tatis yeah. one right off the bat yeah. was one for me, just because yeah. we had spent literally like 15 minutes on the on a podcast just a couple days ago or last week talking about where we would take Fernando Tatis Jr. Fernando Tatis Jr. in a draft now with the injury and I said like in the sixth seventh round and I said I think that's about where he goes Chris said I'd still probably draft him just around the top 50 I thought he'd be off the board already but I knew I needed to get past Chris one more time for him me to grab him and I want to say the sixth or seventh round yep. where you end up grabbing him and yeah. So I'm sitting here without Fernando Tatis on my team where I was only going to draft him when he fell. So that one was the first one. Well, maybe not the first one, but the biggest one. A couple other ones that you've grabbed from me as well. I'm I'm still uh, like borderline crushed about the Wander Franco thing because I was I just <laughs> I was it was perfectly set up for me to draft Franco and Tatis and have like it's weird to say the safety of a player that just turned 21 years old, but to have that floor and then to be able to wait until mid June, Fernando Tatis Jr. to become a superstar, I'm 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 furious. I'm, I'm madder than a white hen, <laughs> as my grandma would say. Um, I got to pick a reliever here, unfortunately, and I'm gonna go with. Uh, <laughs> I would like to go with Garrett Whitlock because I think he's the best reliever of this group, but it, I think the Red Sox are going to give him a chance to start. So I'm going to do what everyone should do and draft a reliever oh. on a team that's going to win 50 games and take David Bednar just oh, because I man. think I just think the rates are going to be there. I would imagine he still gets 20 to 25 saves. I would prefer him to be my reliever three over my reliever two. And also I think uh, Jordan might have been thinking about taking him. Mm-hmm. So Sounds I'm, like it. Uh, Sounds like I'm, it. I'm pretty happy. I, I will trade you David Bednar for Wander Franco right now. I, I'll post Ooh, that right yeah, up. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely make <laughs> hands. We can shake hands on the air, guys. We can I just, shake hands on yeah, the air. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll run it up the chain. Too, so. yeah. <laughs> I just need to say, and I am not going to take this player, either of these players, the fact that there are two Barlows that no one's ever heard of projected <laughs> for 25 saves is really something special. It's something. Um, but before I run out of time here, uh, I am going to go ahead and select Dylan Carlson for nice. one of my uh, next utility spots. Uh, just one of my favorite uh, younger younger players in the league, uh, switch hitter, obviously. Um, and he, he, you know, I, 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 you know, not the best ballpark and maybe not the best offense to be driving in too many runs, but I'm just, I'm a big fan of the player. So filling in more offense. I, again, I need more pitching. I'm going to have to take a reliever here. Should I take one of the Barlows? I think you should. 
He's well, like I'm just pleased that <laughs> yeah. you took a guy, Dylan Carlson, on brand with your team, only two stolen bases last year. So <laughs> you're, just, you're sticking to your principles. You I think this is a punt. My guy's I, already on second base, so I'm, I don't I, know. I, there you go. I would bet Dylan Carlson runs more this year, too. He's a that guy too. who I, I sort of had that minors. thought. Yeah. So, so, you got to trade yeah, him. I, uh, you got to trade yeah, him. Yeah, yeah no. If he can, if he can get me, he's got to go. To 11 stolen bases, that'd be great. All right, so my next pick here. Um. Okay, so really, I'm thinking I got the Barlows, and then Jake McGee. Is he really the projected closer? That's a really tough situation. It's going to be him or Duvall. Drew already yeah. took Duvall, which made me upset because I think he's the better relief option. But I imagine that all a bunch of guys are going to get saved. Tyler Rogers and his 48 mile per hour fastballer is going to get a chance <laughs> yeah. to finish up well, some so games as well. I would have. I actually would have taken Knable. I think. Mm. Yeah. Got picked. I was waiting for the ball to me as well. Yeah. He seems like the guy that Girardi would just go to, even if they have, if he has better options. Um, I mean, whatever. I don't even care about these relievers at all. So I'm just going <laughs> to take, I'm going to go ahead and take another pitcher. Now nah, I'll just take Jake McGee. Nah, I won't think about saves anymore. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I think that he's good. I mean, he's, he's fine. Yeah. I, I think Duvall that... is like, I mean, Duvall's so fun, but like, I still feel like he's got another year of like figuring it out. It could you know? be. Yeah. You know? Like he is yeah. so as fun as he was in the postseason. Like, I don't, I'm not sure they're, they're handing it to him just yet. So I, I think it's not like McGee was bad. So like it, it's, it's, it would be weird if they just decide at least to start the year. To give up on no, I, I don't feel great about it. I was running out of time there, like, whatever. <laughs> I'm debating between about 86 players with 24 seconds, yeah, give or take. And that's okay. that's a that's always <laughs> a fun thing. Just think which one does Colin want most, and yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Like, I'm, I'm uh, looking right. at this with an intention like Chris is gonna pick it. So, what's I know I know that Colin is a big Yankee fan, so I'll take the opposite of a Yankee player, and I will go with the sweet, sweet chin strap of Alex Verdugo. Wow. Um. Okay. I think he's really going to help in the average category just because yep. of that swing. There's got to be some more power there. Now, look, I've just said that about Andrew Benintendi as well, who's another player I was considering with that pick. Mm-hmm. Um, not going to help me in the stolen base category, which thrills Jordan. And uh, oh, I man. guess, yeah, but I do think that he is a guy that has a chance to be a, a 300 20, 80 guy. And that's pretty good value in round 14, I suppose. Colin. That brings us to you. Is the pick yeah. made? Are you? Are we set? Are we set? No, we are not set, load. but we're choosing between two right now. So we'll see where we we'll land on. Barlow's are the Barlow's going undrafted? What's what's the deal here? <laughs> I, I, Can we get a Barlow? I want to leave them for Can you to Barlow. come back around to. Uh, <laughs> All right, yeah, maybe I'll take both of them next time around. There you go. No one else. Oh, we can only hope. I don't, we can only hope. I don't love this, but I know that the talent is here. Oh, and the team is there. The team is there. The talent is there. It's just about staying healthy for Nathan Avaldi. So, uh, I mean, if he can be, uh, and there's Jared Kelnick, who's the other one who I was choosing between. So I oh, put me on the same page Zanino, here. Zanino, Kelnick, back to back. These people are trying to kill me. This is wow. real. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that oh, there goes is one Barlow. Yeah, there goes. The man's there Twitter goes. bio literally mentions Zanino, and, and that just happened. Oh, I was like, oh, I can wait for Zanino for the end. Oh, yeah, man. come on. No one's drafting Zanino right now. I, I got to be oh, honest. Really. I'm pretty surprised to see Zanino go ahead of some of these catchers. And me so too. Am I. I get it to a point because his ability to hit the ball out of the ballpark is really nice. There's that <laughs> chance he's going to hit 130, man. Like there is just absolutely yeah. no approach uh, at the plate whatsoever. And I mean, don't I, again, you kind of love that true three outcome guy? Just oh, close your eyes, yeah. swing as hard as you I want. Love, and let's see where that thing goes. Chris, I love Chris. to watch it. I don't love it on my <laughs> fantasy the next day. Fair point. Chris, your fantasy yes, team sir. needs leaders. All right. <laughs> it you need the captain yeah. the the guy who is keeping everyone in line your pitching staff will be much improved That's if you take zanino i don't know if people have factored that in <laughs> they wow. haven't That's a fair point i, will I just say this, feel like man uh mike zanino is the only super fractor that i have in for my for my fellow card friends that that means something but um i'll trade you wander franco for the super fractor <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have to buddy. <laughs> So, you want to so, this fake league for the <laughs> so Mike Zanino, for those wondering, was the seventh catcher off the board. We saw Seiya Suzuki go at the end of round four. Chris Crawford, uh, what, what are your thoughts on Suzuki as a uh, round round fourteen? I may have misspoken there. What are your thoughts on Suzuki as a fourteenth round pick? 
I really like that. And I'm kind of mad at myself for not t- taking him in that area. I think that's a really nice pick. My only concern for fantasy this year is I don't think he's going to get a chance to drive in a bunch of runs, but I think mm-hmm. he can help in other categories. This is a legitimate bat. I hope people don't get concerned by looking at some of the other um, foreign players that signed that have gone through some struggles. This is the best foreign bat that is signed, in my opinion, in a long, long time. I think it's a solid value. And at this point in the draft, if he doesn't, if he does go through some growing pains, it's really not going to hurt you. I think that was a really nice pick. Okay, we are, let's see, a couple picks away from Colin. We're in round 15. We just saw Brendan Rodgers go with the fourth pick of round 15, preceded by Lourdes Gurriel Jr., who you had mentioned earlier, Chris. Colin, uh, is there anyone you're especially holding out for here with two picks to go until you're up? I'll be honest, it's going to be really hard for me if Joey Gallo is still sitting here in two picks. That left-handed oh, swing at Yankee Stadium yes. in year two, like, where is he on the rankings? Me. I don't even. Uh, he is on here. Where is it? they got him at one forty one on the expert rankings and two fifty eight on the regular. Oh ranks. my god, but... this is crazy. I'm missing out. I mean, for a guy who close down. his eyes and get thirty five home runs in, in right field in Yankee Stadium, as long right. as he doesn't destroy my batting average, which again, I'd, I'd like to think that he can get me a little bit better there. Uh, look, yeah, just don't what, what be under two hundred. We get there. What's yeah, the that's a good two hundred is destroy. Under two hundred destroying. Destroy. Yeah, that's okay. So we're good with 203, on but 199. <laughs> What'd you say? We're, 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 we're good with 203, but I'll take it. I mean, yeah. he's projected for 205 on here, and somehow, yeah. if that's better than that, he should help. But my my picks earlier of like LeMahieu and Harper and others, like sure. I think there's enough batting average on my team that I can get by with someone who I think can genuinely right in 35 and 70 on a Yankee team so long as he's playing all year. So give me to him. Uh, right. uh, your last pick of round 15, Chris, and then Jordan to follow as we uh, yeah. come down through our last round together. So I'm not going to lie to you folks. I kind of forgot that I haven't taken a catcher yet, and I think that's true <laughs> about uh, a few rosters. There's two catchers that I really like at this point, and it's Kiebert Ruiz and Tyler Stevenson. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of whether or not who I like better – uh, for two, I know who I like better long term, and that's Ruiz. But for 2022, I think I'm going to go with Tyler Stevenson. It would have been easier for me to make this pick if uh, the Reds didn't trade everyone to the Seattle Mariners that I really like. It would have been uh, because I think run production might be a little bit of a struggle. But I feel more confident about him filling the five by five than I do about Ruiz, just by a slim margin. And, you know, if, if anybody wants to play it in no catcher league, please let me know because I'm all for it. <laughs> Seconded. Uh, Jordan, does. Right. Jordan does now that Zanino's gone. He, he, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Heartbreaking. All right. Well, I need two relievers at least. And we still, right? Bo- oh, one of the Barlows oh, got man. taken. Oh, no. Oh, come on. Boy. Well, the that good news is I off. really, wow, they are. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take Garrett Whitlock because I am a huge fan. Whether he saves or not, sure. I just am a huge fan of what he's about. I love Rule 5 picks. So I'm going to take Whitlock, and he'll just be, you know, he'll be solid. I, love I think it. at this Thank point, you. I think at this point in the draft, that's a, what yeah. you can ask for. I mean, yeah. well, I'm looking at this relief pitchers remaining, and boy, is it just a, a picture Oof. of horror just all the way yeah. down. Like, there's just not much I like here. So if you're going to tell uh, me about a guy who can give you elite ratios, counts as an RP, and again, Matt Barnes is not established as the closer in Boston. Right. If he ends up working his way into that closer role, I mean, that's a steal in the yep. 17th. Yeah, game. I don't know. I think – I think, Chris, I think I will give you Wander Franco for David Bednar. I mean, I just, oh, wow. Great. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think I'm that scared. <laughs> That's fair. That's ah, fair. excellent news. I'm glad we, I'm glad we got that deal done. That's <laughs> yes. official, right? I can announce that to the commission. Yeah, that, uh, absolutely. Yeah, send right, it in. Right, send right it at in. the buzzer. Right at the buzzer. Just I'll be the witness. Zeno super fractor. We'll lock it in. <laughs> <laughs> we added some terms there at the end. Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. Well, we're coming down to the end of our five rounds together. This was fun, guys. Colin, Chris, Jordan, appreciate it, guys. Have a good appreciate one. y'all. This was fun. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. I hate you, Jordan. Give yeah, me back, Wander Franco. See you right. later. See ya. See ya. 
All right. You can get all the latest fantasy baseball news and analysis on the go with our podcast, Circling the Bases. The crew is just wrapping up their positional previews. Those are great, by the way, for draft prep. And the podcast is expanding to five days a week as the season starts. Keep your edge on the competition and subscribe to Circling the Bases anywhere podcasts are found. And we're now here to bring us home with our final group of experts. It's Justin Mason from Fantasy Benefits and Fangraphs, Shelly Verstraight from The Pitcher List, and the guy who's been holding it down in the 12 spot, who's going to appear momentarily, Drew Silva. Guys, how's it? How are we feeling about the uh, about the squads here? Uh, Drew, you are on the clock right now, so why don't you uh, talk us through what you're thinking with this pick? And then yeah, we'll I, have I mean, Shelly I definitely need speed, um, and that's my target here. And I'm going to go with Miles Straw. I have an outfield spot open in this three outfielder league. I don't I don't know if Straw's ranked 237th in the default rankings at Yahoo, so I don't know if he'd come off the board in like a normal 20 mm. round 12 team draft, but he's the best bet for stolen bases left and could bat lead off for like a depleted Guardians team there in Cleveland. Um so a good amount of runs scored. So I think he plays every day and and is going to get me those steals. And Shelly, you're now on the clock in round 16. Do you know what the pick is here? Have we decided? Uh, not really. I mean, I'm kind of going between two picks here. Um, but I think I'm going to go with a multi-eligible guy in Thai France. Um, I mean, I really like what he did last year in Seattle. I mean, with the with the trade to get uh, Jesse Winker and Suarez there, I mean, the lineup is even more legit and hopefully fingers crossed Julio makes his uh, debut this season. So I think I'm going to just take the multi eligible guy of Ty France. All right. And that brings us to you, Justin, with your 16th rounder, uh, where are we headed here? Uh, I just like to say first, I do not like drafting near Shelly and drew. Um, <laughs> this Shelly, is a theme. Shelly, this is a theme. Yeah. yeah Shelly was my tag team partner in the tag team uh, league last night. Uh, and we, we see eye to eye, which means I don't want to draft next to her because uh, this has been brutal. And Drew's been just crushing my cue the entire time. Um, I mean, my team's pretty much full. I, you know, mm -hmm. we're in the reserve rounds pretty much. I, I don't draft a catcher in a one team league until the absolute bare minimum okay. end. Uh, so I'm going to go uh, with a guy who I think is a locked down closer. Um that is kind of underrated with Dylan Floro. Um, so unless, unless the Marlins make a last minute move, which I don't really expect him to, I think he's pretty locked into that role. I think Jordan Schusterman could have maybe used that guy as mm. we spent the last few rounds looking for a reliever for him. Uh, and Justin, you really locked down saves early with Liam Hendricks and Josh Hader. Is that a recurring strategy for you in drafts or is that just how things felt to you in the third and fourth rounds? It's a little bit of how it fell to me, but it's also something I try to do. I, I do not want to play uh, with a bunch of kind of quasi closers. I mean, we see yeah. it every year, right? The, the middle ranks of closers just get turned over left and right. And sure. There's probably about eight or nine situations I feel pretty good about. And even those get messed up, right? I felt good about Will Smith like a week and a half ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that one crushed me. So, um, you know, to get the top two closers off the board uh, and just not have to worry about delving into the rest of the pool, especially in a league like this, it's 12 teams. There's no MI or CI. There's only three outfielders. It's, it's such a shallow league that you mm -hmm. can kind of, get away punting some offense because there's going to be plenty of depth later on. Uh, Justin talked a minute ago about how brutal it was drafting next to you guys. Shelly, are you having a similar experience? <laughs> yes, essentially. Like every, every time, like I have a guy queued up and it's just either Justin takes him or, you know, Drew takes him. It's just like, okay, fine. At least I, at least I'm, you know, in the group of like some smart guys who I, we all are, we're all together here, so. <laughs> Drew, you started this draft with Mike Trout at 12, followed it up with Max Scherzer, Marcus Semyon, Robbie Ray, and Eloy Jimenez surrounded your top five. How are you feeling about that start and, and your squad as things have progressed? Yeah, kind of a, a veteran squad. I, I So I'm yeah. drafting on the turn at like 12, 13, which I really like to do because it feels like you get – two top 15 guys instead of if you're drafting one overall, then you have to wait until pick 24 for it to come back to you. 
Um, so I, I feel better about my odds when I've got two top 15 guys as opposed to two top 25 guys, essentially. Um, I need Trout to bounce back. I need him to to run a bit, too, because um, my team is very power focused with Jared Walsh and CJ Crone and Eloy Jimenez. Um, so I, I would like to see a little bit more speed out of Trout. But I think he could do that. Like he still rates well in terms of sprint speed. Um, he still has a very high percentage uh, like caught caught stealings to attempts. And so I, I think he could run if he wanted to, and maybe he will do that a little bit more this year. That Angels lineup could be really good if Anthony Rendon returns healthy and Otani does his thing. And Walsh just builds on what he did last year and his like mini breakout. Um, so I, I feel good about it. In like a 12-team a shallow league like this, I feel like at the end of the draft, you're always feeling pretty good about it. Um, uh-huh. I'm going to have to be creative about picking up saves along the way. I mean, I have Camillo Duvall and Corey Kniebel who I feel like should be semi locked into their roles, but I, I think the giants with Duvall, they're going to rotate maybe Jake McGee in there and, and Rogers and who knows with the Phillies bullpen, it could be uh, some, could be some question marks up and down that depth chart. So it's, it, it would take some in season management if we were playing this league out, but that's, that's the nature of, of that role in this modern era of fantasy baseball. That Knievel pick was super sneaky because in Thank Yahoo, you. apparently, he has right. starting pitcher uh, eligibility, which means when, you know, you can slot him in there. Uh, I, on I did not days. realize that. Yeah, yeah and it's a da- <laughs> it's a set up as a daily moves league. So, like, you can slot him in at starting pitcher. Like, I don't think Knievel's got the job to himself necessarily. Yeah. But that starting pitcher, when you can get, when you get closers with that starting pitcher tag, oh, they're so valuable. Yep. I feel, yeah. yeah, I feel pretty good about him having the job, but you just never know. He hasn't you know, racked up a ton of innings over the last couple of mm-hmm. years. And I guess the Phillies will have some options, even though it's, you kind of, I don't know, you, you look at the Phillies and you just think uh, this is going to be a bad bullpen, but I mean, Jose Alvarado has late inning experience. Jairus Familia has late inning experience, not, not necessarily lately. Brad Hand has late inning experience. It's kind of Sir Anthony Dominguez could finally come back. Um, so they might have some options there if Knebel hits some road bumps or or has some health trouble. I'm probably uh, going to look. For, talk- oh, yeah, I'm probably go going to look Drew. for more saves here down the stretch, though. But it's yeah, you look at this relief pitcher rankings of what's left, and yeah, you're throwing darts. Shelly, let's talk about your start to this draft. Um, you were all in on the Astros. It was Kyle Tucker, Jordan Alvarez, followed by Lucas Giolito, Whit Merrifield, then back to Houston. For Alex Bregman. So let's talk about that top five and just your team in general. Uh, things you're happy with and maybe anything you're uh you wish you had could have back. Oh, I mean, I really like the start to this team. I mean, I got power, I got speed, I got my ace. I mean, knowing that um I'm gonna take some gambles with some starting pitchers that I think can like really just blow up this year. Uh later on, I was like totally just going, I was focusing on getting power and speed. Um, plenty of uh, plate appearances as much as I could handle. Um, and I just I just really like that start. I mean, you can't really go wrong. I mean, Bregman kind of has like some, you know, injury issues, um, but he was like that last third baseman, right? Like there's like a teardrop right mm-hmm. at Bregman. Um, so I'm like, I just got to grab him before I have to just kind of really close my eyes and pick a third baseman. You're up now, and- Shelly, by the way. And, oh, and Justin, okay. yes, yeah, Shelly's on the clock. And Justin, you just took Marcus Stroman. I mean, it's the 17th round. You don't necessarily have to, you know, sell why you made the pick this late, but I, I would like to hear your thoughts on Stroman. I'm not a big Stroman guy, typically. It just felt like this was super late. And uh, I, I did draft uh, Chris Sale earlier. So I need the kind of like reliable arm. And it's mm-hmm. kind of what Stroman is, right? Like he's just going to pitch a, you know, a good amount of innings. I love that they added uh, Andrew Lynn Simmons uh, at shortstop uh, to kind of improve that infield defense. So, you know, it's a kind of unsexy pick, but 17th round, you're kind of just looking for solid innings that you can trust. And that's Shelley, what this uh, Dave Stefani pick is about to be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a nice fit for him in San Francisco. I don't know like if it's going to be elite across the board, but he feels super solid in terms of like going to get a decent enough workload and, and an ERA maybe right under four with, you know, maybe about a strikeout per inning. And then 
I just I don't know what to do with this second pick on the turn. I'm going to go with Michael Conforto. I, I don't know where he's going to land. Do you guys have a prediction for that? I would have loved if it was Colorado. They were talking about maybe making a play for him, but I don't know. I saw something earlier, and I don't know if it's true, but that the Blue Jays were interested in him, but he's unvaccinated. Ooh, and so wow. that was a deal breaker, I guess. So I don't know if that's true or not. That's where I had said last week I thought he'd end up. Yeah. Um, so, but that's uh, that's unfortunate because he he'd look pretty good in that lineup. He's got huge bounce back potential too. Like last year, I, I I'm willing to just kind of throw it out with the injuries. He was excellent from you know, 2018 to the shortened season in 2020. Shelly, you took Hunter Renfro in the 17th round, mm-hmm. near the end of round 17. I, I mean, it almost feels like he's a little bit overlooked for a guy who had 31 homers and 96 RBIs last year. What are your thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan um, of his. I mean, what he did last year with the Red Sox, um, I mean, honestly, I didn't really expect it as a Red Sox fan. You know, with <laughs> him, you know, you know, picking him up, I was just like, okay, it's going to be kind of whatever but I mean he really bounced back after you know I think it was a year um in Tampa where he just like looked lost um and then with the surprise trade of um you know him going over to um the Brewers uh, I I actually I really like that uh landing spot for him I mean it's a good ballpark to hit in and I believed in all all the changes that he uh that he did last year and they they need him like that that offense is I mean yeah, it's a perfect fit, and if he just continues what he did last year in Boston, that could be a, a huge get for the Brewers. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we forget sometimes is sometimes guys who get labeled as platoon players, especially short side platoon players, just haven't had the opportunities to prove that they're not that. And you know, Boston gave him the opportunity to show that he's not just mm-hmm. a platoon guy, uh, and he mm-hmm. took advantage, and I think he's going to hold a lot of those games. Like, he didn't have like a huge BABIP, uh, you know, uh, or anything like that that propelled those gains. So I think he could keep a lot of what we saw last year and just be an absolute stud in Milwaukee. Yeah. And you both, Shelly and Justin, that is, both went reliever there in round 18. Matt Barnes for you, Shelly. So talk us through that one. Um, it's more of a, a close my eyes and just pick the, the best reliever at this yeah. point. Yeah, um, for sure. I mean, Boston gave Matt Barnes a contract extension last year. And while they haven't really like settled on a closer and Alex Cora has said that, you know, they're not going to go into the season with a closer. It was the same thing last year. Um, it's been that way every year, except when they had Kimbrell. Um, I don't know who else that they're going to put there. I mean, I love Garrett Woodlock, but they're now they're thinking about putting him in the rotation. It's all up in the air. Um, so I just took a gamble here with Barnes and yeah. Justin, was the similar thing, similar thing for you with Lou Trevino, close your eyes and uh, hope for the best with that reliever pick. I mean, who else is going to close in Oakland? Um, I mean, I think Trevino starts for the job until they trade him, which they obviously could do, but he's my fourth closer. I'm mostly just drowning the pool and, and making other people who don't have closers (laughs) sweat. Uh, I like which, it. which is always fun to do. So, yeah. Uh, but I mean, yeah, I think he's one of those guys, again, underrated. It's not a situation that seems very crowded. I mean, I guess AJ Buck could take that job at some point. But then, especially in a league like this, you just drop him and move on, right? You know, go pick up a different streaming uh, starting pitcher um, or whoever is the next closer somewhere. Uh, we've talked a decent amount uh, on this broadcast and elsewhere about third base being a thin position. Drew, what are your thoughts on DJ short getting Josh Donaldson to close out round 18 there? Hey, if he stays healthy, it's going to be a great pick, but we just, I think at this point, man, like when we were doing our, our third base position preview episode for the circling the bases podcast, shout out, um, like having to look into his numbers, like the baseball savant, the batted ball data, it all loves what he has been doing when healthy. Um, so it's just about him staying on the field and third base is shallow. You're right. I got Matt Chapman. I forget what round that was. Felt pretty good about that with the move to Toronto. Um, I think, you know, to talk about Chapman for a second, I, I think ev- you know the, the poor batting average last year, um, the poor overall batting line, I think, I think it all, it all ties to that late 2020 hip surgery. And the further he gets away from that moving into some, 
uh, more favorable hitter parks in the AL East. I, I think he's going to be a, a great value in drafts this year, hitting maybe towards the lower part of that lineup, but still soaking up what everyone in front of him is doing as far as the more teammate dependent uh, numbers. Like he struck out a ton last year, but a lot of it was like pitches inside the zone. Like he wasn't really chasing. Um, so it tells me that the plate approach is still okay. It's never been like tremendous um, and that he just couldn't you know, turn his hips as well as, as he had in the past. And I, I think we see a healthier Matt Chapman this season. We're coming down to we're in round 19, our second to last round of the draft. Justin, do you have any favorite flyers without giving away about five picks to go until yeah, give you, me some are ideas. Any, any favorite <laughs> late? Yeah. Can you, can you give away anything for Drew and Shelly here? <laughs> Um, I mean, a 12 team Yahoo league is so, so shallow that, uh, yeah. there's so much talent still on the board. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm a big Bradley Zimmer fan. He wouldn't factor in a league this size. Uh, but both, for those of you looking for like a deep sleeper in like a 15 team league, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of him. You know, like there's a, so much talent on the board, like Colton Wong still on the board, you know, a guy who, you know, plays second base and steals bases, has a little pop, uh, Nate Lowe. Like I think he or Nathaniel Lowe now, um, oh, like yes. he he made some real gains, kind of closing that hole in the top of his swing, um, and all he is is like a Vlad Guerrero esque, uh, Vlad Guerrero Junior esque change to his launch angle, like we saw Vlad Guerrero do last year, and he could have a monster season. Plus, he chips in with stolen bases. Uh, you know, Brandon Crawford coming off of his monster season still on the board. Like, there's so many guys. Um, you know, but this is why it's important, like in these shallow leagues, like obviously we're not playing this one out, but like churning and burning that bottom part of your roster, right? Just like find, you know, finding and riding those hot waves and stuff uh, it is really, really important. I like, the, I like that you have Jack Flaherty up on your screen there, Matt, your shared screen. Uh, Do he, I? He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's been on the board. top of the the ranks forever because he's uh, <laughs> injured. <laughs> and I, I don't the even know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't even know if that's me, but he is strangely on my screen as well because I'm your mm -hmm. co-manager, Drew, as you may know. Um, yeah. But yeah, Jack Flaherty. As the resident Cardinals fan, I'm I'm worried about that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's um, yeah, that's slap tough. tear. Like he, uh, he can say that he's been pitching with it for four years, but it's I think it's definitely gotten worse if if he has been doing that. That's a serious like career altering injury, um, and I I don't. I, this could be a lost season for him. So I don't know. I, we would need to hear more, but I don't know if I would even draft him in a, in a league like this, that th is this shallow, which is sad. Should we, should we tell Justin that he's picking now or maybe? Just, no, no, yeah. I, I, I've got it. You're I'm, just it. Trying, You're I'm trying it. to figure out what awful catcher I want. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I mean, I guess I'll just take Gary Sanchez because maybe leaving New York is like going to be the best thing for him. Uh, so, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, at this point you just throw a dart at a catcher and then you rotate them off your roster as, as someone else gets hot. I was happy to get Shit. Will Smith though. I, I mean, I, I understand that in this type of league, you could, you could definitely wait on a catcher and cycle him through Travis Darno. Mm -hmm. Like if he's healthy, he could be nice. Mitch Garver, if he's playing a ton, he could, he could be nice. Sean Murphy mm -hmm. even has like post type potential. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree. There's plenty of time to wait. All right. Who, what am I doing here? I'm going to go with Rowan wick here for my first or final pick in the 19th round. I, I guess he'll be, he'll be the, the Cubs primary closer. Um, but you know, I don't know how many games the Cubs are going to win and they could easily cycle through some different names in there. And then I have no idea what I'm going to do for this pick. Uh, I guess I could use another bat. Just go with the best hitter available. Which is? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <sighs> Shelly, you, you took Luke Voigt. You are you uh I think you may be missing a shortstop. Is that uh is that the plan in round twenty or did I miss something? You have uh, you have a multi position eligibility person I missed? Yeah, uh Jazz. Uh Jazz at short. Yes. You're right. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. They slotted him in at second, which was Yahoo. Uh, Yahoo fooled me there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with Brandon Crawford. I don't know. We'll see if he Speaking can replicate of. what he did last year. But yeah, for a, a guy that finished fourth in the NL MVP balloting to be sitting there in round 20, uh, I think it's worth a shot to see if, if the changes he made are, are real. He's what, 35 years old now, though. So 
Uh, the Giants are going to need some more old man magic out of that lineup. So Shelly does not need a shortstop, but is making her final pick right now. Shelly, what's it going to be? Yeah, uh, I think I'm going to get my last pitcher here. I'm just going to go ahead and pull the trigger. I still love, I love the talent. Um, Marquez, you never know. Um, I know it's in Colorado. Um, it's probably kind of like one of those picks where you just, it, you know, just, just put him in and just, just let him go. He'll, he'll give you the stats at the end of the day. He'll give you the strikeouts and hopefully he doesn't kill your other ratios. 176 strikeouts and 180 innings at 440 area, 1.27 whip last season. Justin, it's down to you in the 20th round. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I'm, I'm just baffled by how much is still on the board here. Um, I'm going to go with someone who I think in uh, on, on a different site might have gone a little bit earlier, but he's a little buried in, in the ranks on Yahoo. Um, and that's Ahmed Rosario, you know, especially because he's shortstop and outfield eligible on Yahoo. And I love those guys that can move from, uh, you know, the infield to the outfield uh, and just love guys, who, especially in a daily moves format like this would be. Uh, can just move around the diamond and cover as many days off as possible. So, uh, Med Rosario on the team. Snag you, you snag yourself some stolen bases there too, mm -hmm. potentially double digits. Um, all right, well, your teams are in. Drew, we're going to talk with you about your roster uh, a little later on. Well, shortly after this draft ends. But Shelly, Justin, before we go, I want to get your final thoughts on your teams. Shelly, let's go with you first, and then Justin. Uh, yeah, I love the offense. The offense is going to kill it. Uh, but if this league was being played out, I would definitely be churning and burning with all of my pitchers. <laughs> Justin, any any th things you're happy about? Anything you uh, regret? Um, no, I mean, I, I'm pretty happy with it. The, the, the Mondesi pick is obviously kind of a, uh, a Hail Mary throw, but I think it's something you can get away with. Uh, uh, easier in a, in a smaller kind of format league um, mm -hmm. because there's so much replacement value and there's IL spots. So I play a lot of 15 teamers. I play a lot of NFBC where there's no IL um, there. It's much deeper. It's, it's all harder to roster a guy like that, but um, I like my team a lot. Um, you know, I'll be interested to see how Yahoo grades it out. And if I am projected to be the champion of this mock draft, uh, because I would be very disappointed if I am not. <laughs> it's pretty much the first place you go, right? Straight to the uh, Yahoo grades. You got to get Absolutely. that validation. Mm -hmm. Well, anytime I do, I, I use Yahoo for uh, my home fantasy football league, and, I, and my wife's in it. And every time uh, she gets a grade higher than mine, she just does like a victory lap around the house. So. <laughs> right. And you got to uh, draft. Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Drew. When does that grading come out? It's pretty immediate, isn't it? Yeah, it's usually pretty yeah. close. Yeah. Yeah. You can uh, hit the standings tab right there. And it'll, it'll show you what the projected standings are. 11th so, place, Drew Silva. Yeah, there you go. See. Beautiful. I, I, yeah, don't believe it. True. I can't do it don't on my phone, it. unfortunately. You're uh, an usually eight, that, Justin. Oh, that, that's perfect. That's exactly where I want to be. I just, not, no one's afraid of me. Uh, I'm unassuming. Right. I'm just going to sneak right. up on you. Um, <laughs> guys yeah, guys so, will have a chip on their shoulder a little bit from the low ranking. Mm -hmm. They're going to feel slighted. Oh, see, this is home field advantage. Look, Scott Pianowski at the top with Yahoo. Just home field advantage right there. Yeah. That's, that, that's bias. Yeah. It's rigged. It's rigged. Mm -hmm. Crawford. Loves Chris Scott. Crawford projected to go second. But yeah, Pianowski may have rigged that. that that's certainly mm -hmm. a strong possibility. Well, guys, we're at the end of our 20 rounds. We are going to have a bit of a draft postmortem coming up. But for now, Justin, Shelley, thank you, Drew. And I will talk to you in a minute. But don't go too far uh, because we have a little postmortem roundtable coming up. Guys, thanks. But first, a reminder to download the NBC Sports Edge app to get all the latest MLB player updates and breaking news alerts. Plus, you can track all the players you just drafted or we just drafted to gain an edge on your competition. We're now going to bring back DJ Short, Drew Silva, who left for about 12 seconds and is ready to return. Oh, hi, Drew. Uh, hi, DJ. And Chris Crawford. Guys, we're going to do a little bit of a post-mortem here. The draft is complete. We've gone through 20 rounds. The way we're going to do this is everyone's going to go through their own team. Feel free to weigh in on that person's team after they're done, and then we'll quickly uh, get your thoughts on who's the biggest winner. But first, let's start with you, DJ. You picked first. Your thoughts on team DJ Short. Yeah, so I really liked attacking speed at the top. 
Uh, so getting Trey Turner and Starling <clears throat> Marte, um, you know, in my mind, both projected for 30 plus steals. I really didn't go after steals much the rest of the way. Um, but that's okay. I was trying to get, to catch up on the power front as the draft moved along. And I think I did pretty well there. You know, Kyle Schwarber, Yasmani Grandal, the catcher position, Chris Bryan and Coors Field. I'm a fan of that. Uh, so uh, Jose Abreu as well. So like, I think there's some really solid run producers there. From the starting pitcher side, I found out about five minutes after I drafted Shane uh, Boz that he needs elbow surgery. So not not a fan of that, but still, oh, I, I actually I think it's that. okay. I didn't yeah, see that it either. Happened during the happened during the draft. So uh, of course, uh, it I actually it don't think it's roll it back. It's not the roll no, it it's okay. okay. <laughs> it's okay. You know, it's not the worst thing in the world to leave a draft with someone you know who is going to go into an IL spot. So. That's okay. You know, I'm not counting yeah. on him to be one of my top three starters, for example. So I was actually okay with that. I got three closers as well. Uh, Iglesias, Melanson, and Kittredge. I know the Rays are a little shaky. Uh, you can never really trust them as far as closers are concerned. But Kittredge was so great last year. I still think he's the top option there. So I think I have a really well-rounded team. I just hope that, you know, Turner doesn't get hurt at some point. Or um, Starling Marte's oblique isn't a big deal because I don't have much speed aside from those guys. Did you guys hear that spin from DJ? He, he had a guy go under the knife and he's like, I like that because I cut <laughs> straight into an IL spot. That is excellent spin. DJ Chris, it's a spin your room. thoughts it's on a spin room. You're right. Your thoughts on DJ squad quickly. Well, uh, I won't be too mean to it because I, I like my job. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's a really good squad. Uh, I like the fact that he has guys like Trey Turner who make up for the fact that some of these guys are not likely to hit for batting average. You know, that likely 315, 320 makes up for some 240s that are going to happen there. Obviously, the Bass thing, that's that's a bummer to me, that's for sure. Um, I like the starting pitching. I think there's upside there, especially if Montas is playing for a new team. I think it's a solid mm-hmm. squad. True. Your podcast Julio, partner yeah. has, has drafted. Wait, what are your, your chance? Your chance to slam him here, or you can choose to be nice like Crawford. <laughs> I think I, I said it on during our segment, but you know, in a 12 team, 20 round draft, I, I don't think any team looks bad on paper unless yeah. you have someone just going sure trying to like make up a, a joke of a roster, which I guess Crawford might might have done. Oh, ah. <laughs> no. oh there it is. <laughs> just, I'm just but uh, no, I, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of upside. Julio Urias, I wanted badly. Um, did you take him right after I? No, no, no. That that was back on the turn. And Chris Bryant should be shooting up rankings going to Colorado. I don't, I don't understand mm-hmm. that marriage necessarily, but good for Bryant right. getting paid. And you know, third base is shallow, and he can play first base too in the outfield on Yahoo. Um, so I like that. DJ and I talked a ton about Freddie Peralta on our starting pitching uh, position preview. He's a super interesting pitcher, like very unique mechanics for a guy who's going to be a starter, uh, hopefully long term. I'd l- go back and listen to that episode because we had some good discussions. We did it like right after, like right during the, the CBA negotiations. So I think we were both a little exhausted, but uh, it turned out pretty well. And yeah, Supporting I mean, the basis podcast, yeah, download it wherever you get your podcasts. Absolutely. Good, good work. Um, yeah, can I, I just think. Say, can, oh, go yeah, ahead, Drew. Go, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm done rambling. I, I was just gonna say. I, speaking of circling the bases, I was listening to all those positional previews before this draft, and I really enjoyed hearing. You know, you guys go through the anguish of that lockout, and just like every time, it was like more sure. and more. I had to. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, that yeah. would be weird to, have... to binge listen to that. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was amazing. I recommend it in real time. Go back and do it. It was because <laughs> yeah, quite we, a, quite we tried to yeah we tried to keep them evergreen, but there was just no way to not mention what was happening. Yeah, yeah. no, but the the previews are great. I I really do mean that. And uh, let's go down the line here in order in which we drafted. Chris Crawford, your thoughts on your team, and then uh, DJ and Drew will eviscerate it right after that. That's totally fair with me. Well, I got to tell you, I love the starting pitching, which I did not expect to do. I spent like. 30 podcasts talking about how I didn't want to take pitching early. And then yeah. Garrett Cole fell into my lap and I'm still a huge Shane Bieber fan. I have some questions about the wins, but I really like having those two guys near the top of my draft. I think Luis Robert is a star. I think that he's the next big thing. It would not shock me at all. If he ended up being a top five fantasy player this year, I'm just a huge fan of that talent and the situation. So like having that, the Fernando Tatis Jr. pick was, I'm sure, drew some ire. But look, I, I would rather have him on my roster for a half a season 
than not have him. I, I, I just think his talent is so special. So the fact that I can have a guy like Fernando Tatis Jr. with a Luis Robert, it's just something I couldn't pass on. And then, you know, Bobby Wood Jr., one of the best fantasy prospects that I've scouted. So still mad at Jordan for sniping Wander Franco from me, and I'll never, ever forgive him for it. But uh, I think that I've put together a pretty solid roster, and I guess we'll see. Yeah, if Shane Bieber comes back healthy and anything close to his normal self, like right. those are two two of the best pitchers in baseball. You know what I mean? So uh, I think that's really solid that, to have at the top there. Your lineup is really well balanced. I'd say there's about six players I would project maybe for double digit steals. So mm-hmm. kind of a little different than me where I was top heavy in, in stolen mm-hmm. bases and you know, you're piecing it together. I mean, Tommy Edmond, hopefully he stays in the lineup. I think there's a little bit of danger there. Yes. Um, but there's a, a really well-balanced lineup here. Uh, some of it might hinge on, you know, does Bobby Witt Jr. make the opening day roster? Because you're going to be counting on him. I mean, you have Lindor too, but to get that uh, middle infield help uh, mm-hmm. certainly would be a bonus while you're waiting for Tatis. For sure. I think, yeah, you took some big swings. Like Bieber, obviously, hoping that he's healthy. Uh, Fernando Tatis Jr., obviously you're going to have to stash him for at least probably two months, maybe three months. Anthony Rendon coming back, that's, that's you know, coming back healthy is not a sure thing. Edmund, um, but I mean, they're, they're like worthwhile swings. Ranger Suarez is super interesting. Like if he does anything close to what he did last year, he could be. I still love him. Yeah, I mean, I, there's some some risk there that like he, they just put him back in the bullpen. It, it doesn't go well, but there's also huge upside. Right. Um, with a guy that turned in an ERA under two as as a first time starter last year, and you're gonna probably have to if if we were playing this out, do some in season managing to pick up saves like mm-hmm. comb in the waiver wire because what you got Jordan Romano, uh, David Bednar, who I, I think is kind of underrated even though he's the Pirates closer. Right. Um, and then Devin Williams, you're kind of going to need like a Josh Hader trade for that to, to come through at least in, in the saves category. He's always good in the ratios and the strikeouts, but sure. Yeah. So the, if we were playing this out, you would, you would need to be paying attention to your team throughout the year to try to pick up some saves here and there, but yeah, I mean some big swings, but uh, a lot of upside for sure. All right. Speaking of big swings, Drew, you picked 12th in this draft. We talked a little bit about your start with Mike Trout and Max Scherzer at that first turn. We now have the full snapshot of your squad, so give us your thoughts, and then DJ and Chris, you can weigh in. Pretty veteran heavy, like Trout, Scherzer, Simeon, Robbie Ray, even Eloy Jimenez could be called a veteran, Jose Altuve. Um, but, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with going veteran heavy. It's always kind of sexy to chase upside in a fantasy mm-hmm. draft, but there's nothing sure. wrong with going with established players. I was sort of freaking out about my lack of speed. Um, that's why I went with Miles Straw. What round was that? Like 20 or round 16, which is 16. probably a little early for him. He's not a perfect player and doesn't give you a ton outside of speed, but maybe he takes a step forward overall and, winds up hitting leadoff in Cleveland. I don't know if that means much, but as long as Jose Ramirez is there and Fernando Reyes is there behind him, um, he could be a, a good source of runs scored beyond the stolen bases. And, I mean, Justin Mason and I were talking during our segment about in a you know 12-team, one-catcher league like this, you might as well just wait and like cycle through catchers even if you need to during the season. But uh, I love Will Smith this season, Me too. and so I I went a little aggressive with him in in the seventh round. I mean, I I DJ and I talked this again about uh, uh, on our catcher preview for the Circling the Bases podcast, and I, I think he's going to have a huge year. Like the playing time will be there, and hitting wherever he hits in that lineup, even if it's like fifth or sixth, he's just going to rake up the more teammate dependent counting stats. And yeah, I mean, the batted ball data, I'll, I'll love what Will Smith has done in his first you know, two and a half years up in the majors. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, the mile straw pick, it was kind of one of those things where you had to go out and get some speed. Yeah. I don't know if he's going to be in your lineup every day. Um, in a league this size, which is pretty shallow, I would say, you know, assuming Michael Conforto signs somewhere, I'm going to guess he's going to be in your lineup over straw. Uh, you might just mix and match straw when you, when you really need him. You're also probably likely going to have to go out on the waiver wire and add a bit more to be competitive, uh, in stolen bases. Another thing I noticed you seem to wait on closers 
Um, there were quite a few, including myself, who uh, went a bit earlier than than we're accustomed to 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 get you know that trustworthy closer. Uh, you're taking some chances here. Camilo Duvall was obviously really impressive with the Giants uh, down the stretch last year. Has oodles of potential, but uh, Gabe Kapler could go unconventional with how he uses his bullpen there. Corey Knebel, you know, he was an All Star back with the Brewers. Uh, we'll see what happens with the Phillies. They looked good in the short sample last year. Uh, Rowan Wick there in a rebuilding situation with the Cubs is a possibility, yeah. but um, you know, there's there's certainly some risk with the names you chose, but also quite a bit of upside. So I think that's going to be interesting. Yeah. I, I, I personally, I think Duvall is going to be the guy who ends up getting the saves opportunities there. And I, I, I did like that pick, but I, I do admit that there is utility there. I, I love Drew's power. Like that lineup has rock and sock him all over it. There's a <laughs> lot of guys. Eloy Jimenez to me is being underdrafted. And I thought he got that uh, Drew got really good value um, with him where he did just because like this was a guy we were talking about as a second or third round pick last year, and I still think that offensive ability he should not have even been playing last year. Like his his shoulder was hanging by a thread basically, and then for him to come back and to be able to do what he did at all is really impressive. Um, you know, I do think that there are some there's some volatility here in batting average. Like like Matt Chapman is going to be a guy who's probably always going to hit 210, 220. And I also love Mike Trout uh, in the first round. And I kind of regret a little bit not going Trout, even at the eighth pick, just because it's Mike Trout, man. He's so good. And and even without the stolen bases, I still think the average, the power, and the run production is going to be there. Stolen bases are just kind of an added benefit. But, yeah, it's a solid team. I'm sorry that Yahoo is being so mean to you and projecting you at 11th. But, I mean, that's just – and, by the way, I am projected second. Uh, Scott and I will fight. I, I think I should be projected first. It's clearly some sort of magic going on. Yeah, isn't it funny well, how the one Yahoo guy yeah, in the draft was yeah. – yeah. <laughs> But they, yeah. Yahoo, yeah. Yahoo does such a good job with all of this stuff that you can't complain. If he wants to put himself at first with how good that draft engine is, I am totally fine with it. Yeah. So aside from your your own teams, uh, yeah. who is your favorite team you saw or a team that stuck out to you? Ooh, that's a good one. I really do I like Scott's fun. team. Yeah, I really do like Scott's team. I think Shelly's team is really solid as well. It's very mm-hmm. balanced. Um I didn't think anybody did a bad drop. I have to say, I'm impressed. Jordan Schusterman, my buddy, is not exactly a fantasy baseball connoisseur. I thought he did a really nice job addressing um, players when he did. There was no overdrafts other than the fact that he uh, screwed up at the very beginning, but we can all forgive them. We've all had those situations happen to him. But, yeah, I will say I really like Scott's team. If I was to put some dollars down on this, you would probably have to take my credit card from me, but it would also be uh, the team that I would think would win this league. Chris, I'd say Chris Towers. Uh, yeah, I was just going to yes. say that. I was, oh, I, I was going to say too. Yeah. You know what though? He like totally punted saves, which is not fair. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, you get Vlad in the first round, Acuna in the second round. I mean, he may yeah. have a, you know, he's going to have to make it work to start the season. Right. But, you know, once Acuna is ready, Man, that lineup's going to be a lot of fun. He also waited a while on starting pitching, but he ended up with Max Fried and Charlie Morton, Shohei Otani. So, you know, he's going to be okay. And also a lot of young upside later, which I love. Michael Kopech, O'Neal Cruz, who's like already a spring training darling right yeah, now. Yeah, he is. <laughs> that ball was clobbered uh, today. Yeah, Jared Kelvick as well. So, like, there's some fun upside there. Luis Severino, if he comes back and can be something uh, like we've seen in the past, like – I think his team could be really, really good. I will just say this. Like, I, I I like that team a lot. There are some big ifs in there. Like, if Byron Buxton is going to stay healthy. If George if, Springer. If George Springer can stay on the Michael field. Michael so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 so, it's like a team that I can see a wide range, but there's no doubt I think he ended the draft with the most upside of anybody. Yeah, yeah we haven't even talked about Yelich and Buxton, so there's a lot of sure. – a lot of boom and bust potential on that roster, but it's funny Absolutely. that we all landed on that one because there's yeah. a lot of intrigue there. Um, all right. Well, that is bringing us near the end of the proceedings today. I want to say, first of all, there is going to be a draft grades column up on NBC Sports Edge being written by George Bissell. He's going to be grading the team. So we've already talked about Yahoo's rankings, but George will have the final word. And I can only assume he's going to be absolutely ruthless there. Yeah. And on that note, guys, that is going to do it for us. I want to say thanks to all of you guys and the rest of our experts for joining us today. Uh, reminder to keep it tuned to NBC Sports Edge for fantasy baseball news, columns, draft strategy, 
and much more. And check out, of course, the Circling the Bases podcast where you can hear all of these guys on there. Guys, thanks. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for all the latest fantasy and sports betting advice from NBC Sports Edge. And don't forget to sign up for NBC Sports Edge Plus to get the best in class draft guides as well as season long fantasy, DFS and sports betting tools that will give you the edge.